little bit of a bad performance here because of my... Um... Now, we analyzed about 168, I believe, parameters derived just from the epithelium in order to find out which parameters correlated best with detection of keratoconus and in order to be able to get us to find a way of detecting keratoconus at the earliest stage. And in this stepwise linear discrimination analysis, discriminant analysis, all of these variables were put in, but only six of them survived. And this six variable model gave us extraordinary specificity of keratoconus. There was 99.2% specificity and almost 95% sensitivity in detecting keratoconus. Now, Renato will agree in his lecture uh, following me that this is unprecedented specificity and sensitivity. However, it does mean that there are false negatives and false positives that can occur. And so it is very important to go multimodal as he will explain to us after my lecture. So we think of epithelial thickness as an adjunctive tool to confirm or deny the presence of keratoconus. So here's an example of suspect topography, suspect tomography, and we're using the epithelial thickness profile to confirm or deny the presence of keratoconus. So as you see, it's a, well, I mean, it looks like weird and keratoconus, but it's not inferior steepening, okay? And then we look at the tomography and with the Bell and Ambrosio plot here, and you can see that it's flashing up red. Well, that's concerning. And of course, then we put the epithelial thickness profile on top of this. And we see that where there was elevation on the posterior surface, so there is thinning of the epithelium on the ultrasound map with thickening surrounding it. And here's an, um, uh, uh, an RT view uh, with thinning and thickening surrounding it. So the, here the epithelium is confirming that there is keratoconus. Uh, somebody's screen capture again, I can hear you in the background. Switch your microphone off. <laughs> Take pictures more subtly. Uh, you can have my slides. These are completely um, uh, for sharing. Here's another example, which is of interest. We have a case where the topography is normal, but the tomography is suspect. And I want to know whether I can exclude keratoconus in this case. Uh, I really apologize for this. Uh, it's just so damaging to my performance. This is a 29 year old with a very steep cornea and minus eight with cylinder that is not right. Yep. Hello? Hello? Uh, yeah, I can hear you, but um, your, video, your, your screen sharing is very slow. It's uploading um, in pixels. In pixels? Hmm. Uh, can you can you uh, go back and forth through this uh, now through the slides yeah. now? What I'm going to do is I'm going to present. What I'm going to do is I'm going to. I, so, this is so frustrating. Um, Now it's too slow. I can't, I, I can't seem to make it faster, I'm afraid. Um, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to jump uh, essentially to the end because I think I've demonstrated essentially what I wanted to show you. Uh, maybe I will show one last case if it's possible for it to load. Uh, I, I, will, I, will, I will try to reshare my screen here. Dan, uh, I don't know whether can can you hear me? Yes. This is Susan. I, I so I could see your screen, so I think the problem name may not be at your end. Maybe you can just try loading that slide again. Okay. How about now? I'm loading uh, this slide here. How's that? Mm. Still slow. 
Yeah, a little slow, but it's not pixelated. It's it's the screen's clear, so I, I'm assuming. Uh, okay, you know. So let, let's just flash through this. Here's this case with a very steep cornea, oblique cylinder, best corrected vision still 2016, and you see here that the the Bell and Ambrosio plot and the, and the and the D parameters are they're all red. This looks very bad, and one would say that this case is you know a high risk case. The keratoconus pattern is even implied by the atlas. But this is a case where the epithelium confidently allows you to completely exclude the presence of keratoconus. You look here at the epithelium map as it loads, you see that you, with this kind of back surface disturbance, you would expect there to be a sincere disturbance within the epithelium that would be obviously visible. But both the pattern deviation map of the epithelium and the stroma are both completely normal. There are no, there's, there's no um, depression in the epithelial map. And the correlation of those locations is such that we can happily exclude keratoconus. And actually we did LASIK on this patient. Um, the classifier in this case, for example, that the, the Silverman Reinstein classifier that I showed you that we published in IOBS was a high normal in terms of epithelial thickness profile. So I cannot really show you more examples because of the speed of these. And I'm very aware that I've, I'm taking up more, more time than I should be. So I will stop on this case because I think it's dramatic. And I will then allow uh, Renato Ambrosio to expand upon how we would go about perhaps confirming that this wasn't keratoconus uh, using multimodal approaches. Thank you. Is that, is that all right? Okay, just in time, uh, Dan. Yeah, okay. That's very Thank unusual. You so we're, we're, we're very unusual. Uh, you're surprised. Very unusual. A surprise you're... that you're on time. Okay, um, so now it's a turn for uh, Renato. Uh, who's going to speak about multimodal imaging for keratoconus? Welcome, Renato. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. We can hear you. Okay, great. So it's always a pleasure to participate. I say hi to everyone. Good, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. And this is one of my favorite topics. This is my financial disclosure. Uh, I have to acknowledge many colleagues that collaborate with me in Rio and Portugal and at the University in Sao Paulo at the UNIFESP and also in Rio. And we know that keratoconus is something that we turn to be a subspecialty. And it's very much related to refractive surgery. We need to screen cases. And also refractive surgery took us to the level of having tools to treat patients that uh, broke paradigms, including cross-linking. However, it's important to understand the paradigms and the paradoxes that we created with those tools because refractive surgery and therapeutic surgery for keratoconus should not be the same. We have an exponential number of publications in keratoconus, and this is probably going to keep increasing. Multimodal imaging is a different concept than just to tomography and topography. And it's gonna help us for early diagnosis, for prognostically telling the patients that uh, have more chances to progress and eventually to treat advanced uh, cases, not to have in an early phase of the, of the patient. Uh, it's important to understand the ectasia in terms of classification is a inferior ectasia, pellucid, keratoglobus. It's important to stage, to follow up. It's important for the patient orientation and education, especially when you talk about pediatric patients that you have to explain to the, to the parents about the condition and explaining why to do surgery, why eventually not to do surgery, and eventually to treat, starting from refraction. We have wavefront helping us. 
I can hear you. Can you can you listen? You can listen very clearly, but unfortunately, your screen is not. Uh, did you, are you transitioning through the screen? Why eventually not to do surgery? And eventually. Oh, I can. I can. Is my screen now good? Uh, actually, uh, no. We can't see your screen. You cannot see my screen. No. So, I'm sorry. For Can you that. share your screen, please? I will share my screen again. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Can you transition through the screen uh, to the through the slides? Yes. Uh, I can. Yeah. Now can it's you see moving. my screen? Oh, yeah. thank you. It's so we have it's very blurry, Renato. Blurry. Yeah. Very low resolution. They're transmitting. Yeah, very, very low. It seems that perhaps the internet's very slow around the world right now. Yeah, probably everybody's doing yeah, everybody, webinars. Everybody's connected to us. We are all connected. Yeah, we connect. We have many connections, and we have multiple people connecting at the same time. I have I have seen other webinars going on right now. So it's it's always good people that are linked to us. So uh, if we keep moving, uh, enhanced diagnosis yeah. is going beyond, but not over. Beyond, but not over detecting keratoconus. We don't want to detect keratoconus only. Of course, detecting keratoconus is important. And of course, we don't want to go over topography, which is front surface topometric data. The concept is using multimodal imaging to enhance our understanding for ectasia susceptibility. Every cornea has a resistance and the impact from the environment will take us for the understanding if the cornea will undergo ectasia, which is basically biomechanical failure that any cornea may eventually develop. This is important to understand that eye rubbing is very, uh, play a very important role. And this is the basis of the Violet June campaign that I welcome you all to join. I do believe the month of June in 2020 will be very special for all of us and violet june will be meaning a lot not only for keratoconus when you think about refractive surgery refractive surgery took us to the level to understand ectasia because we want to avoid keratectasia or progressive ectasia after lasik it can happen after the prk and definitely after other procedures and eventually after smile too I have seen ectasia progression after fake IOLs as well. And it doesn't mean that fake IOL caused ectasia, but you can have a progressive keratoconus in a patient with a fake IOL as well. So refractive surgeons should understand keratoconus and detect patients that will be at risk for the, the developing the complication. The first cases were related to iatrogenic ectasia in patients with very high myopia that had ectasia due to the impact of the LASIK procedure. But a few months after that, Professor Seiler published a very nice paper on foam fruit keratoconus. And the question is, what is the definition of foam fruit keratoconus? We know topography is important. I was very fortunate to train with Steve Wilson, who did his fellowship under uh, the supervision of Sid Kleiss when topography was pretty much being conceived as a very important tool for cornea and refractive surgeons. Refractive surgeons should understand that topography is sensitive to detect abnormalities in patients with 20-20, this is correct vision, and almost lit lamp biomicroscopy. However, the fellow eye of this patient that we consider the fellow eye with a normal topography from a very asymmetric ectasia patient tells us that topography may not be the most sensitive way to detect mild disease. From fruit keratoconus is hard to define, there is no consensus. If you go back in time, 50 years ago, Professor Emsler did a very nice work defining foam fruit keratoconus as an incomplete or abortive form of any uh, of keratoconus. Kreshmer gave a talk uh, at the Konya Day of about 12 years ago, defining mild keratoconus as foam fruit. Steve Kleiss in a brilliant editorial on the British Journal of Ophthalmology to find the fellow eye like I just shown to you. I humbly would give my definition that foam fruit keratoconus is a, a cornea that has high susceptibility for biomechanical decompensation and ectasia progression. 
So the question is how to characterize ectasia susceptibility going beyond topography is fundamental. Tomography is different than topography. And we have here a very example that has a relatively normal topography. I would say it's normal by mode of an analysis of a series of experts. This was published in JRS in 2013 that the mode of the classifications will say this is normal. The patient had ectasia despite of a low PTA, good residual stromal blood, and a nice thin subbalmer keratomyleosis fat. The retrospective evaluation of the tomography of this patient would say that this patient has susceptibility, not keratoconus, not mild disease, but a susceptibility for developing the disease. And this is something that we have to evolve. Topography abnormal is not what is from Fru's keratoconus, but in Topographic readings, you see topographic readings as a form through skeletoconus as a classification for topography or even tomography. And we have cases that have pretty much normal topography and tomography, looking at the elevation and the thickness mapping, and these patients develop ectasia. So those are cases that are normal and develop ectasia. However, there are cases with abnormal disease, uh, disease-like looking tomography, that are stable after LASIK after, uh, and these patients have relatively thick corneas despite of abnormal elevation. And age is a very important factor. And also the correction should not be so high. So these patients were stable after LASIK and this will be the no ectasia with the so-called form fruits. I do believe that ectasia susceptibility was relatively high here. However, we have to go beyond and eventually taking the risk for going ahead is something that every patient should understand. So we have a conundrum of ectasia after LASIK with 20 years of mystery. We have our series of patients that had ectasia that we have the pre-op pentacam and you see 1.5 is the best number for the bad deep. However, it would detect 60% of cases. If you go to topography alone, the ABS uh, asymmetry of the inferior superior you have only 22.9% of sensitivity. So it's relatively low. We can improve tomography observation so that we can get the Pentacam Random Forest Index that was described by Bernardo Lopez. And with artificial intelligence, we can combine with the flap, age, residual stromal blood and ablation, all the data in the relational tissue altered concept to have an enhanced ectasia susceptibility score and we have cases that would have some risk that were stable, and eventually some cases that would be at low risk, eventually those patients rub the eye. I can tell you that uh, these cases had the fellow eyes up here. So if you consider bilateral screening, all these cases of ectasia would have been detected. However, we have to go beyond. Tomography gives us more information than topography, but we have to go beyond. And biomechanical data is very important for us. It's very important to understand that corneal biomechanics should be translated into a metric. And the very good work from Paolo and Ricardo Vinciguera to describe an index, which is the biomechanical index from the Corvus would be very important. This uh, was awarded with the Troutman Award from the ISRS as the best paper of the JRS in 2017. Our idea is to combine the data tomography and biomechanics. This is something we have done since the uh, early times with the aqua response analyzer and integrating shine fluid tomography and biomechanics, we use artificial intelligence. And we also added those cases, the fellow eyes with normal topography from very asymmetric ectasia cases. They are topography normal based on strict criteria on topometric data, including Kaisa, IS value, central K, and no TKC, which is a topometric pattern of ectasia detected on the keratograph and on the pentacam. So we have here a D that is translated into a metric from zero to one, which is a DI, CBI, and the TBI. And you see the dot plots, the separation is much better as you can see in this uh, original study. Uh, we have different thresholds for ectasia, for clinical ectasia, and for what I say to be uh, mild ectasia, 
it's very important that we understand that some cases will be with high ectasia susceptibility, even though they are still normals. And some cases will be low, and eventually those are truly unilateral disease as we can uh, hypothesize. We have to do external validations before clinical implementations. One of the external validations, a very nice work done at George Wayne the fourth clinic by my friend, George Haddad, who received the Colon Award a couple of years ago at the ESCRS and has some cases that they saw with a very asymmetric ectasia presentation that the bed D was relatively normal in the fellow I and the TBI was 0.43, indicating some susceptibility, while the fellow I will be a very mild with a not very bad uh, situation of the, of the ectasia, but you can see that we enhance the ability to screen these cases. Another case that is very emblematic is a patient that did not receive LASIK in the right eye. The fellow eye had LASIK-induced ectasia. You would operate this patient based on topography and minus six. However, this patient has a relatively borderline tomography. And when you look at biomechanical analysis, integrating to the tomography, you have a TBI of 0.78, which indicates susceptibility. This patient, I don't say this patient has keratoconus. I do believe that this patient has ectasia susceptibility. Epithelial mapping is also very interesting here. This is a published study on a twin, identical twin sisters. You have both eyes with uh, normal topography from one of the twins that admitted not rubbing the eye while the other twin admitted rubbing the eye. And you see the similarity between topometric data on Scheinflug and Pentacam and the topo topography from Placido with a keratograph five. And you see the TBI is abnormal in all the four eyes. This is a very interesting situation that the patient presents with very asymmetric disease and the fellow eye is very much normal. So the left eye has 2020 or better than 2020, actually uncorrected vision. The patient has a keratoconic appearance in the right eye. We did a ring. The patient did very well. You see the astigmatism is 0 0.2. The patient was uh, moving to London and I had uh, sent this patient to Dan Reinstein for doing his prolific examination, very complete examination that included the Artemis with a normal epithelial thickness profile based on his algorithm that was published in the IVS that he just presented. And also at other metrics like the Damien Gatineau and Alain Saad score on orb scan. And this patient has a TBI that was not part of any study. This patient, the data was there and I was able to retrospective evaluate the TBI of zero. And he came back last year and actually two years ago, and he was still very stable with 2020 plus two uncorrected vision in this eye and still doing very well in the right eye. So I believe that the patient had ectasia in one eye unilaterally. It's important that we saw external validation at our clinic, and we still have some of this very asymmetric ectasia case with normal topography down below. We pretty much had the same sensitivity, but when we see other cases published in the literature from Germany, from Japan, we saw some cases that were in the very asymmetric normal topography uh, cases that will be in a lower range of sensitivity. And eventually this gives us the ability to improve, to optimize. So we got the data from this series and from other series. So we expanded the series so that we can see that in, in the newer series, these are the new cases, when we have the clinical ectasia, which is the keratoconic eye and the fellow ectatic eye from the very asymmetric ectasia cases, you have a very good sensitivity as you have in the original study. However, when you look at the very asymmetric ectasia normal topography eyes, you drop the sensitivity here. It gives us the ability to improve and any artificial intelligence should be doing that today, which is to improve. Eventually, it's important to understand that some of these cases were highly selected by these clinics because they are normal topography and tomography based on the bad D, and some were even more selected, normal topography, tomography, and biomechanics. So they were handpicking the cases so that we can have uh, 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 an opportunity to see these cases. Of course, they can be 
unilateral ectasia cases, but I do believe we have to optimize. And the enhancing AI with how large data was done by my colleagues in the brain, and this is the performance of the new algorithm that you have still a sensitivity of 90% and even a higher specificity, but you have more cases up here. We are trying to understand the ectasia cases that are down here and the normal that are high here we're using reversal engineering, using finite element models in which we can simulate the surgery in these patients, uh, like a LASIK procedure, a PRK procedure, a SMILE procedure, and see what happens. And that's very interesting. And if you compare with the dot plots from the TDI, I know this is a lot of data, but you can see that the sensitivity was really down to the level of the 80%, and now we come back to the 90%. And this is very promising. And I do believe- One that... minute, Renato. Sure. Please. No, he means you have one, one minute remaining. Oh, oh yes, I, I am concluding now. So the okay. diagnosis of keratoconus is the concept of multimodal imaging with different applications, screening, diagnosing, mm -hmm. staging, prognosing, treatment planning, the role of AI to integrate the data for clinical decision, we need external validation tests, reverse engineering and element, element models, and further optimization is always possible. And eventually the multimodal imaging with epithelial thickness, axial length, anterior chamber depth, ocular waveform parameters could definitely help us to further improve the ability to diagnose and to help patients with keratoconus, especially to treat patients when they need, because as soon as we need the surgery, it should be done as soon as possible. And eventually when we don't need the surgery, you should postpone it because risk and benefits should be considered. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you so much, Renato, for this uh, it's just a beautiful lecture. Uh, once again, we will leave the comments and the question for the end. Uh, we've been looking for uh, Theo, but uh, I strongly believe that Theo is in Germany right now. This is the last information we got from him. And uh, his connection was very, very bad. So we will go ahead for the next speaker. Uh, hopefully he will connect at the end. So uh, we will jump over him and the next speaker will be Susan Jacobs. Uh, welcome Susan, it's a pleasure to have you here. And um, Susan will speak about um, her technique to do the cross-linking using the contact lens. Uh, Hello. Welcome Susan. Hello, hi, hi, uh, Jose, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, I'm just going to share my screen uh, and hopefully it's going to work. Make a host. Oops. Or can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay. All right. I think I have to leave the meeting and join back again to give it permission to share my screen. Just uh, try now. Just give me a minute. You know what, guys? I fixed my um, bandwidth problem completely. <laughs> if you want to stick my screen back on while she's coming back, I can give you two more slides. <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure about that. Can you, uh... We can do that in, while she gets ready. Uh, yeah, we can, go, yeah, we can go to Dang again. There really and is just another couple of slides. Um, if you oh. want to just, um, um, Dr. Jacobs, does sound that sound yeah. fine? Yeah, can you can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Like right now. Okay, yes. we'll do that later, Dan, because we still have time. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if uh, Theo will be able to communicate with us and to connect. I, as I understand from Claudia, his uh, internet in Germany is very very bad. So hopefully we can make it. Welcome, uh, Susan, again. Please start with your uh, lecture, please. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jose, for inviting me here. Uh, uh, you can see my entire screen, right? Yes, yes. All right. Perfect. All right. Thank you. I'm going to be talking on uh, CACXL or contact lens assisted uh, collagen crosslinking or corneal crosslinking as the correct terminology is. And uh, I have no financial interest in this topic of presentation. This was uh, uh, basically, uh, before we go on to uh, understanding what CACXL is, let us first understand the problem. 
So we know that uh, riboflavin has a photosensitizing effect on ultraviolet light. It uh, makes the ultraviolet light cause more damage and it increases the threshold to about 0.36 millivolts per centimeter square. But at the same time, riboflavin also has a protective role by increasing the absorption coefficient. That means it basically acts as a UV sink. It absorbs the ultraviolet light and limits its uh, transmission down to the lower layers. And that's the reason that you have to have 400 microns. And I'm sure the previous talk which Theo Saylor was supposed to take was on uh, 400 microns. And I'm sure he would have stressed on this topic that you have to have 400 microns of riboflavin saturated stroma for making your cross-linking safe. And the reason is because when you have this 400 microns of riboflavin saturated stroma, the uh, amount of UV that's absorbed within that stroma is about 95% and you come down to 0.18 milliwatts per centimeter square at the endothelial level and we saw that uh, 0.36 is the damaging level so you're well below that damaging level and therefore it's safe. Now at 300 microns it's been calculated to be about 0.37 milliwatts per centimeter square it's very close it's even slightly higher than the corneal endothelial toxic levels and that's the reason that 400 microns is so sacrosanct. So this is uh, basically a chart, which I'm sure all of you have seen at multiple points of time. Uh, this is basically with 400 microns of stroma and uh, you have this three millivolts per centimeter square, which is a standard resident protocol. Uh, and when you start with this, what happens is that you get down to 6% of transmission of UV at endothelial levels, which is safe for the endothelium. Whereas if you have less than that, you can see that you have almost 12% transmission of the UV and that causes that endothelial damage. So this led me to think as to what we could do to actually get that UV light down to 6% at the endothelial level. And what I did was basically very simple. And I'm sure many of you have seen this uh, talk at other places, or maybe uh, many of you even started applying it in your clinical practice. This is basically a soft contact lens, which is which does not have a UV barrier inbuilt in it. And that contact lens is also soaked in riboflavin, and it's placed on top of the uh, of a thin cornea. And that takes the uh, entire, the total corneal thickness or the functional corneal thickness above 400 microns. And that leads to an attenuation to safe levels at the endothelial level again. So uh, the questions that can be asked are which contact lens may be used. The most important thing is that it should not have a UV barrier built into it because if it does, then your treatment would be worthless. So check the product literature. It's always mentioned very, clear, very clearly on the contact lens. And also a simple test is to just hold the contact lens under a digital UV meter and check the transmittance and you should get full transmittance through it. A thin lens, lens design is preferred and the one that we use has a center thickness of about 90 microns. Uh, we use soft lenses because they follow the shape of the cornea, they're hydrophilic and they absorb the riboflavin into its structure. Jose, is it clear? Can you hear me? We can hear you and it's very, very clear. Go ahead. Thank you. All right. So the one that we use is the Bosch & Lomb soft lens, daily disposable lens made of Hela Filcon B. I've had a lot of uh, inquiries always through the years as to which is the contact lens to be used, what is the protocol, and if any one of you wants to contact me about this, please feel free to email me and I will share with you everything that uh, is required and that you need to know for the, doing this procedure. Now, this is, an, this is a test that we did, which is basically putting riboflavin solution into soft contact lenses and seeing its transmission, this filter paper beneath it, and we could, we could see that it gets absorbed through the contact lens very, very quickly. And you can see that the filter paper underneath the soft contact lens has got stained when you put UV light on it. So that shows that the contact lens does absorb uh, riboflavin into its structure. Now the UV procedure free procedure is simple. Uh, basically, you have uh, uh, you remove the epithelium, you soak the cornea with riboflavin. You also put that contact lens into riboflavin solution. Uh, put there for half an hour. Every three minutes for 30 minutes, you keep putting the riboflavin over the cornea. At the end of 30 minutes, you put this. Uh, put this riboflavin, uh, the contact lens on the cornea, put a pre-corneal riboflavin film and then uh, apply UV light. Now, this is very, very important. And I'm sure uh, if uh, uh, Theo was talking about this, he would have also mentioned this, that it is important to put just one layer of riboflavin, which means you put riboflavin only over the contact lens and you don't need to keep putting it between the cornea and the contact lens because that leads to an excess amount of riboflavin, which will block the UV light. So remember, don't put it above and below the contact lens, but only above. Now, this is uh, our experiment, and this was anti-segment OCT. We found that the contact lens gives you an additional uh, approximately 107 microns, plus minus 10 microns. To keep your calculations easy, just consider this as 100 microns, and I'll show you how that makes calculations extremely easy. And with this CSE Excel technique, we have been able to cross-link all our patients.
with thick thin cornyas for the last uh, many years right from about i think 2013 or 2014 onwards so now uh, this is the uh, this is the nomogram that we use basically we calculate the corneal epithelial thickness first because we're going to be removing that so now this is your a uh, calculation in in your outpatient department while you're seeing the patient because uh, in the, on the other hand if you have an intra op pachymetry please go ahead and do it intra op as well after removing the epithelium but this is how we do it because you get an entire picture of the entire cornea the pachymetry so we calculate pre op uh, if dan's uh, machine was available with us we would have done that to find out the exact uh, uh, thickness of the epithelium over the uh, over the conical area which would have given us uh, a better calculation however uh, you, you can take it as 50 microns for now and i'm sure dan would uh, ask me to buy his his uh, uh, you know machine and i'm sure we'll get to it because it's a lovely machine and i really like this talk which uh, so clearly demonstrated uh, how how that epithelial mapping can differentiate between keratoc true keratoconic patients and pseudo keratoconic patients so here uh, coming back to the nomogram uh, what we do here is remove the epithelium uh, uh, after after calculating so so i'm sorry let me go back to this again i'm sorry so you uh, sit in your outpatient department look at your pachymetric map and consider let's say the pachymetry comes to be 400 and 70 you know that the conlepthil thickness might be about 50 mic on after uh, you remove the epithelium so let's say microns you uh, did deduct about 50 microns from that you would come to about uh, 4 uh, 380 you know that you've gone below the 400 micron level and so you would post this patient for cac excel now i'm sorry so you measure the pachymetry pachymetry more than 400 microns conventional cross linking or accelerated cross linking pachymetry less than 400 microns then you go ahead remove the epithelium uh, and uh, soak both the contact lens and the epithelium for half an hour in riboflavin recheck the pachymetry intraoperatively and that's always important uh, we use our lasik machine for intraoperative pachymetry checking you could also use the anti segment oct or you could just use an a scan probe by uh, checking where the minimum corneal thickness was on the pentacam or the uh, uh, op scan map now if your functional pachymetry if you add about 100 microns that your contact lens is going to give takes you to more than 400 microns then you go ahead and do a cac excel or an accelerated cac excel if your functional pachymetry still is less than 400 microns what i do and this can very rarely happen what you do is you put just two drops of distilled water and that gives you very minimal corneal swelling you don't need it to swell much you just need about 10 to 20 microns and that takes it above uh, 400 microns and you can proceed with cac excel or contact lens assisted cross linking or accelerated technique the accelerated protocol that i use is uh, 10 milliwatts per centimeter square for 9 minutes and we've been doing that for long and i'll show you some of our results what we found and we've talked about for many years is that we get about 60 to 70% uv transmission through the riboflavin soak contact lens here is the demarcation line that's seen with standard cac excel and with accelerated cac excel again we get we get good demarcation lines here is a patient with accelerated cac excel and you can see we got a demarcation line of about 235 microns in the center 222 microns in the side and so on and so forth we did a study on ivcm with the cosimo mezorta and we found that we get very good results uh, very similar to conventional cross linking with cac excel as well so definitely it is giving you that uh, that uh, those changes within the cornea that lead on to a uh, stiffening of the cornea uh, we've got lots of articles written on contact lens assisted collagen cross linking by now uh it's uh, it's peer reviewed non peer reviewed and everything uh, we had a study along with farhad afezi who's also here now on uh, increased mechanical eff efficiency efficacy of corneal cross linking in thin corneas and uh, what basically farhad afezi and sabin kling said was that the higher oxygen availability which is uh, which is available for thin corneas increases the efficacy of uh, cac excel as compared to corneas of standard thickness which means that thin corneas actually cross link better than a normal thickness corneas and so you get a better efficacy in thin corneas here's a here's a study that was uh, published in jcrs from one of the very uh, prestigious centers in india and uh, they found that uh, they did they did a study which compared basically a 20% dextran with hpmc as the carrier for riboflavin and they found that the mean demarcation line was deeper in the hpmc group and they got about 308 microns of a demarcation line in the hpmc group as compared to 235 in the dextran group so uh, about 235 to 240 is what we approximately get because we use dextran but they found that if you use hpmc you can get even deeper uh, demarcation lines so um, we also uh, had a study published in jrs by 
uh, group from Israel, uh, uh, Nizer, Boris Nizer, and Michael Mimoni. And they also found that CAC Excel has been giving very good results. I would also like to uh, show the share this uh, the study by Wallensack and Spurl on uh, contact lens assisted collagen crosslinking, which is where they came to the very important point that do not put riboflavin both above and below the contact lens, but just a single layer of riboflavin because you don't want too much of a blockage effect. So here's a wonderful, beautiful study that I uh, really like, which is by uh, basically by Brad Randleman. Uh, this was also published in JRS and it was uh, highlighted in many, many other non-peer reviewed uh, sites. So uh, they concluded that CAC Excel provides a straightforward option for cross-linking in thin corneas without requiring complicated equipment or precise manipulation or calculations. And the safety of this protocol has been demonstrated recently. Uh, basically, what they said is if you divide the cornea into anterior, middle, and posterior parts, you see that this is the strength before cross-linking. This is standard cross-linking. And here's how, uh, here's how uh, uh, cross-linking changes the stiffness of the cornea. And they compared the CAC Excel technique in, a same, in the same way. And you can see the great similarity between the maps. In both of them, you've got stiffening. They did say that it's about 70% lesser than in, in uh, cross-linking, which is exactly what we've been saying. Uh, here's what they said. After, stand, after standard cross-linking, there's a significant increase in, of the longitudinal modulus in the anterior and the middle regions, but there's no significant stiffening in the posterior. Now, this is up to standard. And after CAC Excel also, they found very similar results. That is, there's a significant increase in the anterior and the middle layers with no significant effect uh, stiffening induced in the posterior region. So you can see that the CAC Excel and C Excel uh, exactly mirror each other in their effect, except that it's uh, decreased by about 70%. So it's basically a blunted response, which is what uh, they conclude in this article. When you compare uh, that, so here's another thing they said uh, that CSA will achieve 70% of the total stiffening effect. As I said, both techniques induce significant corneal stiffening in the anterior and the middle corneal regions. Uh, the stiffening differences between techniques only existed in the anterior one third, with CSA Excel achieving 71%, whereas in the middle and the posterior layers, there's no significant difference between CSA Excel and CXL. So now that's very important. What they're saying is that the difference in stiffening exists only in the anterior one third. The middle and the posterior parts are stiffened to the same extent. And they, what they said is that the application of a contact lens does not appear to shift the cross-linking effect act anteriorly. So if you put a contact lens, it does not mean that the contact lens is going to get cross-linked and therefore you have less effect on the cornea beneath. What it says, what the study very effectively showed using Brillouin microscopy was that the contact lens does not shift the cross-linking effect anteriorly, giving you a lower depth of demarcation, but it merely blunts the cross-linking effect in the anterior and middle regions compared to standard technique. So what you get is a 70% decrease in efficacy but not, not uh, shifting forward of the cross game. And shows that uh, that uh, basically it mirrors what we've been saying for many years. Mm. I'd also like to say that in our experience, which we, we've treated many, many, many cases now, and we've got a very good effect. We have also seen the same thing. The number of cases that progress us is very, very slow. We've hardly had to do any retreatments. We keep the patient on follow-up, of course. And uh, what basically I feel is that the thin the thin corneas crosslink well enough to be able to withstand that uh, that uh, you know progressive uh, tendency for keratoconus. You still have to keep the patients on on follow up. Uh, you cannot just crosslink any uh, thin cornea, which means that if you've got corneas that are really really thin and are more suitable for dialk, that would be the better option for them, and not uh, not just uh, crosslinking. Uh, so you do have to have some amount of tissue there. But uh, when I talk about my CARES talk later on in the program, I'll also show you what we've been doing for uh, thin corneas as well, where the pachymetry is uh, uh, reasonably okay, but the corneas are very, very steep. So uh, I'm happy to say that we've also now got a machine a company, which has got the CSA Excel protocol integrated into the machine so that you don't have to do a calculation in your mind. The machine does it for you and you can proceed with your case. I think that brings me to the end of my talk. And I think I'm on time. Thank you very much, Jose. Yes, yes, you are. You got one more minute. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for keeping on time um, for your lecture. Uh, once again, the questions and comments will be after we finish with the meeting. Our next speaker from Switzerland will keep on the same topic about uh, cross-linking in thin corneas. Uh, so uh, welcome, Farhat. We appreciate Hi, Jose. you being with us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Now you can share your presentation with us. Yeah. Just trying to figure out. So perhaps going to talk about the Suit 400 protocol. 
which have been, have been working for a little while with this. So welcome, Farhat, we're ready for you. Thank you, uh, Jose, and uh, I'm really excited. I, I saw the number of, of, of attendees that are currently uh, uh, with us, and that's uh, mind-boggling. I think uh, it will change our attitude in the future on how much we travel. I'm just trying to find out, start video, unable to start video. You can start because the host has stopped it. You are the host now. I am the host. Okay, share screen. Now I got it. In Thin Cornea's share, let me see. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Let me just start the presentation. Yeah. There you are. So Great. Right, so happy if you don't mind, um, just one addition I have to say. Uh, if anyone is having any trouble with the quality of the video or audio, uh, they can visit our YouTube link. The one I sent through the message box, I'll send again. Uh, YouTube quality is very well at this moment. You can share it with anyone you would like uh, so we can have uh, a lot of attendees. Um, right now, we have around uh, more than 250 people logged in on YouTube live, in addition to our uh, 900 people right now here. Fantastic. So well. Great. So um, um, I would also like to speak about thin corneas because this is clearly um, a clinical problem that we are facing again and again. Now, these are my financial interests for this topic. And um, the 400 micrometer limit, of course, was established almost 20 years ago because the technical settings and the technical possibilities at the time allowed for a three milliwatt LED and uh, the Dresden protocol for 30 minutes. And so you could see the demarcation line down to a depth of a little more than 300 microns. And this corresponded very nicely to- Your, your screen is not moving for hat. Okay, is it moving now? Um, no, Dr. Hafizi, you're still on the main screen. Um, there's I see, it, it, it moved for me, let's see. I'm sharing. Okay, now it's good. Can you uh, go to full screen now? Maybe the problem is with yeah. full screen, so the problem happens. Is it okay can now? You, can you move through the slides? First, I'm moving screen. forward. Actually, you're not. Uh, for us, okay. you're stuck. Just a second. Screen. Let me try one more time here because I had I had a second I, I had a secondary screen. That's maybe why. Um, how is it now? Let me go uh, back and moving. Nope. Hmm. Do uh, you, what do you see now? Now it's good. When you go out of full screen, it's fine. But when you go to full screen, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, slide through the slides. I, I am in flu, full screen now. Do you see um, an OCT slide? Yes, sir. The problem okay. is not that. Can you, can Please you interrupt me if it doesn't work. So, um, of course, we all now know that it's easy to, to cross-link uh, an early keratoconus cornea with a decent thickness of more than 400 microns of uh, stroma. But what about an advanced keratoconus with a thickness of 260 microns of stroma? And in order to solve that problem, we developed a number of different thin corneas protocol over the years. The first one came up in 2009. This was the protocol that we developed in Zurich, which is the swelling, hyperosmolaric or hypotonic crosslink. Then a few years later, Susan Jacob, whom we heard right, uh, right before me. Again. Excuse me? Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Um, okay, are... let's do it. So I'm, I'm, I'm in... Uh... Yes, I, I, this, this mode probably works better because we can see... Okay, then, then let's just stay in this mode. Um, so, so a few years later, Susan Jacob developed contact lens assisted cross-linking and uh, Cosima Mozotta in the same year proposed to leave islands of epithelium over the thinnest parts of the cornea. And um, let me show you why I do not swell my corneas anymore, like in 2009, and why I do not do contact lens assisted cross-linking anymore, because technology evolves and I think both of these techniques the one we uh, invented, the swelling, and the one Susan invented, the contact lens, have clear disadvantages. Why? Because on one hand, if you look on the one that we have established 11 years ago, the, the, the 
Biomechanical stiffness was questioned two years ago, but a recent paper by Wollensack showed that stiffening is good in swelling. But there is another problem. The problem is that the, st the swelling of the cornea is very unpredictable. Some corneas swell immensely, other corneas almost don't, do not swell at all. So I do not like surprises as a surgeon. And if I never know whether this cornea will swell decently or not, although I always use the same standardized approach, this is not good. And this is one of the reasons why we, about four years ago, were looking into alternatives to swelling. And um, why did we look for alternatives? There is contact lens induced, uh, a contact lens assisted cross-linking, right? But this technique also has a major disadvantage and Susan Jacob mentioned it. Um, I just want to precise that the paper that Sabine and I did five years ago did not show a better uh, did not show a better effect uh, in thin corneas of, of stiffening only. It was a better effect in thin corneas without contact lens. Whenever we put a contact lens on it, we had 30% less efficacy. And Kega Wollensack has published the same thing last year. So I'm sorry, now you do not see all the transitions that would come with the slides. I just am in normal view. But we have, we have seen that, yes, contact lens assisted cross-linking works, but because it blocks so much oxygen, the efficacy is one third less. Why should I live with one third less of efficacy? This might be okay for early stages of keratoconus, but not for aggressive forms. So we completely left that field because until then, everything you've seen now, Susan's approach, our approach is modifying thickness. Wouldn't it make so much more sense to do it differently? Because the current approach, um, you, see the, you see the yellowish um, saturation of riboflavin down to three, no, the, the cross-linking effect is yellow. In the 400 micrometer cornea, we would do the Dresden protocol down to 330 or 40 microns, so the endothelium is safe. And in a cornea that is too thin, we would run into a problem. So we somehow modify thickness by swelling it, by putting a contact lens on, and so on. But this is not the most logical approach. You can modify thickness in a cross-linking procedure. You could theoretically modify the riboflavin concentration, but the most logical approach would be to modify fluence for every single patient. So you do not care about swelling anymore. You do not care about the contact lens. You check the thickness of the patient and you adapt your total energy. Why didn't we do this 12 years ago? Simply because we did not know enough about the metabolism of riboflavin. We didn't even know oxygen was a solution and so on. But this is exactly what we have been doing. We try to keep it simple. So, which means that we developed a protocol we call the sub 400 protocol, which is individualized cross-linking. This is not customized. Customized is something entirely different. Customized would mean more energy over certain areas of the cone to flatten the cone even more. Here, we have the same total energy, but adapted to the individual patient's thickness. So on the left, a 400 micrometer cornea receives Dresden protocol. A 310 micrometer cornea receives an adapted fluence. And the XX in red, we know these numbers. And we, as soon as the study is published, you will all have these numbers. And you can do the same thing in a 240 micrometer cornea. We published the algorithm three years ago. And now comes the beauty of it. It makes it very simple. We tested our algorithm in a prospective uh, monocentric study here at the ELSA Institute in Switzerland. Um, and now we have 47 eyes with a young one year follow up and look at the thinnest cornea. That's uh, stroma, 214 microns of stroma. Basically, what, what we see is not too much of a shift in stromal thickness throughout the imbibition with riboflavin. It's, it is hypoosmolaric riboflavin, but the sodium chloride content is modified, so you do not really swell a lot, maybe 10 micrometers or 15. So you remove the epithelium, you put your riboflavin in, and then 
The trick is at the end of these 20 or 15 or 20 minutes, it's HPMC riboflavin, you measure your thickness and you get a number. And your, your number says 305 microns. And then basically once our paper will be published, you will have a table that tells you, oh, at 310 microns, you need these many minutes at three milliwatts or nine milliwatts to create a demarcation line that is 70 microns from the endothelium. This is our safety limit. So we have done this and the results are uh, quite surprising in a positive way. So we didn't see any major changes in refraction or visual acuity, but we had a 2.1 uh, diopter significant decrease in Kmax and we had significant changes in the central three millimeters. What surprised me the most, I did not expect a success rate of almost 90% because we were in ultra thin corneas. I was expecting a success rate of maybe 80%, but this is, this is um, a very high success rate for now. And just look at these corneas. We are now cross-linking corneas like the one above at 220 microns. And you can see the demarcation line and, and it is exactly where we want it to be. No messing around with swelling or no swelling, no messing around with the contact lens, just adapt the fluence. All you need is an Excel table that you print out. So next step was well, when, if we can cross-link ultra-thin uh, keratoconus cornea, why don't we cross-link a keratoglobus cornea? This has never been done before. And we cross-linked uh, this cornea with a minimal thickness, um, I think in the center of 210 microns. And wow. whether you can trust the uh, pentacam at uh, almost 80 diopters of chemix readings is one question, but we took multiple measurements and it seems as if at least the, the topography is, is stable in a, in a disease. Um, this, uh, we have two cases that was documented progressive before by five, six or seven diopters. And here we, we for sure with a two year follow-up do not see a progression anymore. Some colleagues ask us then, well, why would you cross-link a 230 micrometer cornea if uh, the patient has no satisfactory visual acuity anymore. And I would like to respectfully um, object because if you have ever seen what, what scleral lenses can do to, uh, to an optics, it's just amazing. For example, take this keratoconus with a residual thickness of 108 microns of stroma, an extreme compensation masking effect of the epithelium and this patient had absolutely no functional visual acuity with glasses. He, in fact, was already on, um, on our uh, draft, uh, on our um, transplantation list. And then we gave it a try with a scleral lens and the patient went up to 20, 30. So please do not forget, even with the central scar, there are two reasons why these patients do not see well. It's the opacification due to the scar but it's also the massive irregular astigmatism. And using a scleral lens, you decouple these two effects. You create a smooth surface and all of a sudden you will realize, oh, it's more the astigmatism. It's less the opacification of the scar that bothers the vision. So um, this is a nice example of uh, why cross-linking is so useful in atrophic corneas. One last uh, sentence, uh, there is another proposed protocol um, that was published recently by a dear friend of mine, Cosimo Mazotta, the M protocol. Where is the difference? The difference um, is the following. Our sub 400 protocol has been redeveloped from the scratch. So it is, it is an algorithm that takes the thickness of the cornea and then breaks down how much fluence is needed using three milliwatts. Cosimo has done something very different. He has, he has put together all available solid literature on the depth of the demarcation line with different protocols. So he knows exactly how many, which protocol to use uh, to attend a certain thickness. That's a different approach. What I do not like too much about the approaches. It makes, it makes the, the machinery more demanding, which means you cannot use the most simplistic three milliwatt machine 
10 year old or 15 year old, you need a machine that allows you to do uh, three, nine, 15, 30 milliwatts, continuous light, pulse light, even yontophoresis. Not everybody has all this machinery on board. Again, keep it simple. The sub 400, all you need is one type of riboflavin and a three milliwatt machine. If you have a nine milliwatt, we also have that. We also have that covered in the second table and based on the algorithm. So again, keeping it simple, I think the sub 400 will make it much easier and has clear advantages over our own swelling method and contact lens assisted cross linking. Uh, lastly, this is of course not a single man's effort, it's a team effort. Our um, team has grown substantially in the past two years. Um, these are our team members working on all aspects, um, whether it be uh, animal-based uh, research, um, gene expression or clinical phase three studies. Thank you. Thank you, Farhat. Uh, impressive uh, case with the Kerat Globals. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you for keeping on time. Now uh, we will continue with you. Yeah. Uh, the next lecture, yeah, you are the next one. And you're gonna talk about your uh, sleep lamp cross-linking. Okay, um, I will try one more time. Oh, that's my timer. I will try one more time to switch to uh, to the full view. Let let me see whether share screen. Yeah, and let's see if we can get a full screen for your presentation. And let's yeah, see that would well. be that would be great. Let's Do you see. Any any. Any, uh, any other video application at the moment? Sometimes it, it's uh, it's very easy. I'm checking, uh, but mm, yeah, let me close everything else. Yeah. Indeed, close, close. yeah, there yeah. was Loom open. Idea. Idea. Uh, let me see one more time. Your screen sharing is paused. How is it now? Um, can you move through the slide to the next one? Yep. Yep, it's moving. Perfect. Huh? Fantastic. Okay, so um, the next presentation is about something that is very dear to me because uh, you will see the reason in a second, which is cross-linking at the slit lamp. These are my financial interests for this topic. Now, a few years ago, we realized that besides keratoconus, there is a second huge unmet need that might be um, that might be uh, taken care of with crosslinking. And this is how PAC crosslinking was born back in 2008 with the first publication. And the unmet need is infectious keratitis. And we speak about a totally different uh, dimension here about millions of new cases worldwide every year. It's one of the leading causes of global severe visual impairment. Antibio uh, antimicrobial resistance, antibiotic resistance is a huge issue that will come up in the next years. And we have a lot of diagnostic challenges and therapeutic challenges because it is not very easy sometimes to differentiate between bacterial infections, fungal infections. And lastly, the cost factor is, is extreme. And I'm not talking about medication costs, I'm talking about doctor's costs. In many countries, the medication for infectious keratitis might be affordable, but we are not. So the patient will maybe come to the ophthalmologist or optometrist once, maybe twice, but not eight times in a row over three weeks for a corneal ulcer. So knowing all these unmet needs, we started developing a vision, which means everything we hear here in, in, in this beautiful symposium today on keratoconus management, in fact, is for a small part of the world population of those who can afford us. Um, what about the other 85% of the world population that will never see the interior of such an operating theater for a cross-linking procedure? So the question is, how can we democratize access to corneal cross-linking? This, for example, was uh, my uh, operating room in the University Hospitals of Geneva. And the vision would be, why can't we cross-link like that? So let me tell you why, how and why we, we came to this, uh, to this conclusion. 
First of all, if we look at uh, the global perspective, then we have different challenges in different types of countries. If you look at, a, at an industrialized country, then crosslinking at the slit lamp would have one major advantage, it would reduce costs. Because every minute of our operating room costs a lot of money, and a simple slit lamp is less expensive than a full-blown infrastructure of an OR. Second, I do not want to take an infectious keratitis into the same OR I perform my cataract surgeries in. So you always have to take very special precaution, have this patient come at the end of the list and so on. And lastly, if you have a highly portable device that is mobile, well, if you have several locations, you can just use it in several locations. Other countries might face different uses. And uh, if we take an LMIC like India with highly industrialized um, um, mega cities and then larger areas, remote areas that are underserved, then you could start serving remote areas that have simply no access to ophthalmology. You could increase the coverage. In other words, democratize the access to CXL. And this is what we were going for. Now I will play David's advocate and say, well, if you want to take it to the slit lamp, I have two obstacles. How can a patient stay at the slit lamp for half an hour in the case of keratoconus treatment? And what about the risk of infection? Let's look at these two issues separately. First of all, time spent at the slit lamp. Well, it's not half an hour anymore for keratoconus. We know that. In, if you look at one of the most widely used uh, epi of uh, standard cross-linking uh, regimen for keratoconus, it's the 10 minutes, 9 milliwatts continuous light. So uh, this is my standard regimen if I treat a young adult patient. If I'm facing a child, okay, I will go back to what is the most efficient, which is Dresden. I would not treat a child at the slit lamp, but any starting a young adulthood, absolutely. So 10 minutes for keratoconus treatment, that is totally feasible at the slit lamp. What about puck cross-linking? Well, luckily, oxygen, um, oxygen dependency is not the same issue as it is in CXL. So we showed a few years already, and we have a backup of several clinical studies that have been published or are impressed by our group now, that we can accelerate to three minutes with the same efficacy as the Dresden protocol. So the, 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 latest, uh, the latest clinical results we achieved now were done in 180 seconds of irradiation, and this is totally feasible at the slit lamp. So time spent at the slit lamp, I think we can solve that problem. The second uh, argument that I hear often, I don't know, that I often hear is, what about the risk of infection? Well, let me show you this slide. Please remember that whenever you perform a cross-linking procedure, you do not only stiffen the cornea, you do four different things. You stiffen it, you increase the resistance to digestion, and effects number three and four mean you kill everything on that surface and within that stroma. You kill keratocytes, you kill bacteria, you kill fungi. And you do this in every cross-linking procedure. So if you perform a CXL for keratoconus, don't be fooled. You do not only stiffen the cornea, you increase its resistance, and you kill anything living in the cornea, which in this case will be the keratocytes. So the cornea is sterile at the end of every CXL and PAC CXL procedure. In other words, if you have a mother coming in, with a scratch in her cornea telling you, oh, my, my, my toddler, my toddler girl scratched my cornea two, two hours ago. This lady you see at your slit lamp is more infectious than an open corneal surface at the end of a CXL or PAC CXL procedure. So why do we not go to the slit lamp with it? So I do not think that the risk of infection is substantial. So the question was how to simplify cross-linking, bring it to the slit lamp. Then the first step was taken when my MD-PhD student, Olivier Richaud, came to see me um, nine years ago in March, so exactly nine years ago, showing me um, this image 
uh, uh, this Goldman tip. This is a consumable Goldman applanation tonometry tip, and he has glued an LED on it at the time. It was a nine milliwatt LED telling me, look, the modern LEDs, this was back in 2011, the modern LEDs are so small, I can fit them on the, on the tip of a Goldman. And then we looked at each other and thought, well, if it fits on the tip of a Goldman, let's put it on a Goldman. A few days later, Olivier came, came back with a, a lot of wires. I don't know whether this video is showing, but he basically put put this into, into action. And this is, this is the, first, the first essay. Now, nine years, no. Um, and, and then we started defining the requirements. And we thought, well, if we put it on the slit lamp, we need something mobile, lightweight, should not be only be used at the slit lamp, but should also be uh, applicable in an operating room on a stand should cover all the intensities, should cover continuous light and pulse light, and should be battery operated, and above all, inexpensive, global access. So nine years later, we have the CI device, and the CI device is a device that fulfills all these criteria. It can be mounted on a sit lamp, but it can also be used the conventional, we call it the classic way, in the operating room, if you're not comfortable with uh, the initial approach at the slit lamp. It delivers three, nine, 15, 18, and 30 milliwatts per square centimeter in pulsed light and or continuous light. It has an optimized beam profile, so more intensity in the periphery. Irradiation zone is five to 12 millimeters. And it works with the USB-C charging device. So worst case, if you are highly mobile and you forgot the charger, use your Samsung or Android phone USB uh, charger or your Apple laptop charger to recharge that machine. And uh, as you can see, it can easily be mounted on, on over 30 different Huxtrite type and size type slit lamps or in the operating theater. That's the basic idea behind it. And we have programmed a number of uh, preset protocols, the Dresden protocol, the nine milliwatts, 10 minutes continuous light protocol. This, these are epi off protocols. Then an accelerated protocol here. This is the transition to puck cross-linking, but puck cross-linking even better with 30 milliwatts for four minutes. So this is more fluence. It's 7.2 Joule instead of 5.4. Then we come into pulsed applications. You can use this one. This is Cosimo Mazotta's protocol. It's a very interesting one for yontophoresis assisted epion, transepithelial crosslinking. I believe that this one will, uh, will change a lot in the field because you do not need an oxygen mask to perform epion crosslinking using this protocol. Then there is another pulsed protocol and the sub 400 protocol that I've mentioned in my previous talk will be updated in a firmware in, in autumn and also be available. And then all you need to do is to indicate your thickness in micrometers immediately before irradiation and the machine calculates the fluids. Um, now let's see whether this uh, video will run yes or no, because this is a, a brief overview about how the first How step in should work in the next the slit lamp is applying anesthetics. We use both oxybuprocaine and tetracaine, and we give these I'm drops one fine. after the other, and okay. we repeat this twice within 10 minutes. So a total of three applications of both drops. Inserting the speculum is a standard step in any ophthalmic procedure. This speculum is special because it's an open wire frame, so it is very light and it does not pull down the lid due to gravity. Removing the epithelium is performed using a sterile cotton swab that has been damped in 35% ethanol, and then the cornea is tapped for 60 seconds. So use this movement in a circular fashion and after 45 or 50 seconds, you will see how the epithelium loosens. As you can see here, you see the folds of the epithelium in the center of the cornea. 
and then after the 60 seconds you perform more movements and now we apply gentle pressure on the cornea and as you can see the resulting erosion is nicely centered and approximately 8 millimeters in diameter. The next step is not happening at the slit lamp but in a reclining chair. Apply a pad on the side for projection against the riboflavin and then measure your coronal perimetry. And it's always handy to have a perimetry map and then use an ultrasound device to measure the thinnest point for documentation. Now applying the riboflavin takes 20 minutes and you should apply riboflavin roughly every two minutes as you can see here. Mounting the CI device is rather simple. Move away the illumination arm and mount the adapter. Secure the adapter Just remove the protective cap mount the sterile cap and place the device with the user interface directed towards you onto the slit lamp. As you can see the working distance is roughly 32 millimeters basically you put the apex of the cornea into focus and then you automatically have adjusted for the correct working distance. Switching on the device requires you to scan the label and then you can choose between the different protocols provided. Once you have made your choice of a protocol, you confirm your choice by pressing the OK button. Irradiation is then started by pressing on UV. So this basically is, um, is uh, how uh, crosslinking would be performed. In PAC crosslinking, you do not need to remove the epithelium in in keratoconus treatments for now, we would still remove, but I am quite confident that in one or two years, we will have an epi on crosslinking that does not require additional oxygen. It's just a sophisticated combination of pulsed light, high fluence, and, um, and maybe ontophoresis based applications. And then you, you can directly crosslink at the slit lamp without removing any epithelium. Um, the device comes uh, with a kit that contains the speculum and the sterile cap plus uh, the riboflavin. And now I would like to make an announcement we have been waiting for for a long time. We were blocked a little bit by the coronavirus, but um, I didn't even uh, ask authorization of my CEO, the, of the CEO of the company. But let me just tell you that the device has received the CE mark um, this early this week not only the device, but also the riboflavin. And not only for keratoconus, but for ectasia after LASIK, for PMD, for infectious keratitis. So PAC crosslinking will, um, will not be an off-label use. It will be a CE-marked use, um, as well as for sterile corneal melting and valus keratopathy. Now this, this is, I think, quite a, quite a breakthrough for this technology that uh, should be available in, in a few weeks already now that the CE mark has been approved. One question we get uh, uh, very often, and this is the very last slide, so I will finish in the next 30 seconds. Does the vertical position of the riboflavin, does it interfere with cross-linking because riboflavin would migrate down due to gravity? Um, the short answer is no. We had, um, we had uh, a master student uh, do a little study and even one hour of vertical positioning 
does not substantially change the riboflavin distribution in the cornea. So don't worry, the riboflavin will not just go down due to gravity. So in conclusion, slit lamp crosslinking will be affordable, increase the coverage worldwide, serve underserved remote areas, and democratize access to crosslinking technology. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Farhat. Uh, incredible uh, presentation, uh, really amazing about this technology. Uh, congratulations for your achievement and getting the CE mark so fast. Well, so fast, not as a since 2011, you've been working on this. But I think that this is a very good approach, especially for the low cost and the possibility to do this in the sleep lamp. Uh, because we yeah, never saw uh, Theo here. Um, he uh, said that probably it's not going to be here because of the poor connection in Germany where he is right now. Yeah. Uh, we're going to uh, allow, uh, before we go to the break, uh, Dr. Reinstein wants to give uh, 10 minutes uh, so he wants to complete his lecture. I was surprised that he finished on time. So he's gonna give a, a Dan, you're ready? Uh, uh, I am, if you if you wanna let me start my video. Yes, please. Uh, so it's so, 10 minutes before we go into the break. Yeah, it's two minutes because it's only a few slides that were left at the end there. Um, okay. Allow me to switch my video back on. Yeah. And allow me to share. You're ready for that. Uh, no, uh, you've disabled my sharing um can you just double try again try it again then okay now you now okay i'm back in okay thank you so i've got full speed here uh everybody can see this uh, this slide here yes yes it's okay yeah and can you enable my video I'm, I'm unable to start video give me one minute Making host. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, thank you for her. that. Was uh, really amazing. Uh, congratulations on on such uh, uh, a huge body of work that you've achieved there with your team. And um, uh, we we thank you very much for those contributions because they're going to be huge, as as you say. Um, thank you. Dan. I'm going to I'm just going to carry on from this case where I was showing how the epithelium had kind of I mean this was a strange cornea but it wasn't it did not have the anatomical morphology of keratoconus that's that's the point um and our classifier in epithelium alone uh was able to show us that and and Renato and I were texting offline we would we would have loved to have this patient um uh be tested now with you know, um, uh, air puff technology and, and video, uh, high-speed video cameras. But let me show you uh, uh, the last case. And this is, this is the kind of case where, where um, Renato and I are just trying desperately across 6,000 uh, miles trying to uh, collect um, or to work together. Because here's an example where the topography was normal. The tomography was completely normal. If you look at look at the D values here, I mean it's a 0.34 D, big D. And yet, when we do the epithelial map, if you can see my pointer here, you you, you have a quite quite a lot of focal thinning in the epithelial pattern here, um, and. This is the pattern deviation map of the epithelium. And you can see that as a pattern deviation, there is thinning inferiorly. And our classifier, our epithelial classifier, actually classified this well inside uh, the keratoconus band. So this is a case where I would have loved to know what the TBI is, because even though the tomography and topography were absolutely normal. There's something um, that is at least the, the, has sensitized the ability to detect keratoconus in the epithelium. And I wonder whether, whether the TB, TBI would agree with this in, in, that, in that regard. And if it doesn't, then we're back to what Renato was talking about, which is that multimodality is going to be 
essential. In other words, if, if, if you have a, a series of tests and one of them flags keratoconus, then the answer is it's keratoconus, as opposed to going, well, four out of five tests were normal, so ah, we could do it because the other one, we're just going to ignore it. Um, here's examples that I have from many years ago when I started talking about epithelium and keratoconus. These are all completely normal front surface topographies. All of these were subsurface keratoconic cases where the epithelium has a donut pattern. And so these were really false negatives on topography, exploiting the difference between the epithelial profiles of the two. And here are cases where the atlas every time with its algorithm thought that these were suspect keratoconus cases where the epithelium, the epithelial profile proved that these were not keratoconic, even though the front surface shape um, made it seem like that from an algorithmic standpoint. So we know that OCT is able to do epithelial mapping and we have a number of publications now that have, um, well, they've done step one, which is to show that if you can, if you know that an eye has keratoconus and you scan it with OCT and get an epithelial map and you know that uh, this is not a keratoconic eye, that you can separate the two groups. What, what we're missing on OCT at the moment is something like the algorithm that we developed for ultrasound in order to try and classify an epithelial profile using a, an artificial intelligence type, um, or as we did, a multivariate um, step regression model to try and get that. Now, I want to just finish with a very important point about epithelial profiles because the epithelium responds to shape, change, changes of the shape of the eyelid, but it also can give you a lot of different profile changes depending on things like how much contact lens warpage there was, basement membrane dystrophy, tear film disturbances, MGD. So here's an example. Um, saw spherical lens uh, for one week. This is three days after removing the lens. And this is two weeks after removing the lens. So you see some LASIK surgeons say, oh, a, a spherical lens, you just have to remove it for three days and that's fine. And maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe you actually need to wait longer with soft contact lenses um, than just three days. Here's an example of basement membrane dystrophy. It's obvious to you here, but I, I use this as a good example because in this case, the epithelial, this is the MS39, the epithelial thickness profile looked like a donut. And, you know, given that the anterior surface was, had a skew bow tie, this was maybe a little bit concerning. But when we look at the, uh, at the, at the uh, Insight 100 with the ultrasound, you see that we get, we have this focal pattern with a donut around it and the pattern deviation map looks terrible and it looks all very scary and the thinness, the thinnest point of the epithelium is 42 microns, which is well outside of the normal uh, 53 microns and the keratoconus screening module gives us a, 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 you know, an absolute definite, this is keratoconus. Well, but it's not, it is not keratoconus. This is a false positive by epithelium. Okay. So remember, there's no such thing as a perfect diagnostic test for keratoconus at the moment. And I get people sending me emails all the time, oh, but the map uh, looks terrible, but the epithelium says it's normal. I'm like, well, then, then it's terrible. Or look, you know, the, uh, the epithelium is keratoconic, but the map looks great. I want to do the case. It's like, well, you have to make a clinical judgment. You know, um, there is no such thing as an acid test. If you remember this slide, if you're taking photographs of, the, of, of this lecture, just everybody, um, how many of you, 800 people on there, just take a picture of this slide and just think about the implications of having inferior steepening with, that is due to epithelium or epithelial thinning over a cone. And this is really the picture because you can have the intermediate situation where the back surface is not enough to be picked up by an algorithm, the front surface is hidden by the epithelial thickness. And so you must have an epithelial thickness profile to find these cases and not operate on them in a way that you would for a normal 
uh, cornea. So that's that's all I wanted to, to add, and I'm, I'm glad that my slides were finally working. So thank you for the extra extra few minutes there. Thank, thank you, Dan. Thank you so much. Um, now we're gonna go for a, a 10 minutes break. I know everybody is at home, so there's no place to go. So <laughs> please uh, go back in 10 minutes. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Dan and Renato, let's go to uh, WhatsApp. And this is something that oh, yeah. we need to fix. I have a, I have a question actually for Farhad, if, if that's possible. Yes, it is possible. So, so my question is, um, you know, obviously the fluence is very, very going to be very sensitive to the distance of the cornea to the LED. And so how, how much of an issue is it if the patient who's at the slit lamp is kind of not quite pressing their forehead against there for all of the eight minutes and the distance changes slightly or they are leaning more or they're leaning less, during those minutes that they're having the exposure? Or is it not relevant because if you're dealing with infections, the fluence is, it just has to be high and who cares? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent uh, remark, Dan. In, on one hand, the, um, the device has an integrated curler optics, just like our slit lamps, which means that the, whether or not you are five millimeters behind or in front of the focal point, the intensity still remains at roughly 95% of ah, the output. Okay. This is, this is, of course, for us, nine, five millimeters are huge. It was also an additional safety measure because if a, if a very inexperienced second year resident accidentally focuses on the iris and not on the apex of the cornea, he still is within the normal range of, of power distribution. Right. So, I think we should be fine, but you, you make a very good point. We, we have to stay with the patient during these minutes and make sure the patient stays where he's supposed to be. Yeah, no, great. That's, uh, that's okay. I, I knew you'd worked it out. It's just that I, you know, when I saw the video, I was like, uh, you know, what if? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. but I was thinking more about a first year resident in their first week, you know, not the second year. The second years wouldn't make that kind of mistake, really. Okay. Especially your sure. resident, how they, if they made that mistake, I mean, it would be like, the, it would be for the chopper, right? I would be medical student, fourth year medical student. <laughs> All right. Well, very exciting work that you're doing there. And uh, wow, uh, can't wait Thank to you. get my hands. Uh, can't wait to get my hands on, on, on one of your devices. Oh, it would be a pleasure. Okay, you so, guys, um, we just finished with this first part of the meeting. So we got a 10 minutes break. Uh, so see you back in 10 minutes. Great. Um, yeah, so that's it. I'm going to mute everyone. Uh, you can uh, visit the fridge now.
Okay. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Can, can you undo our video, my video, and also Renato? Yeah, of course. And then, and then did you read that little link that we gave you? Yes. And can you make us both share, make it for us both to share at the same time? Yes, sir. Yes. And then, and then Renato and I, you will, tr you, you and I are going to right now, we're going to try and talk exactly at the same time. And you guys in, in Saudi, you tell us if you can hear us both together or if one of us is cutting the other one out. To be honest, the whole world can answer that question right now. That's okay. 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 We okay. can try to share and we will let you know if one is cutting the other one or That's both right. we can be Perfect. at the same That's time. Right. That's ahead. right. So Renato, our videos are off though. Yeah, make the video on because we'll need video as well. Um, Give me one second. Put the video on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the video is allowed. You can go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, uh, start video. No, it still says I can't do it. Renato is there, but, ah, wait. Okay, ah, you can see me. And Renato, you are muted. No? I don't hear you, Renato. He's not muted, but he, he we can't hear him. We That's right. Hear. Renato, you, you, your sound is not coming through. He's not talking. Ah, okay. now. Now I now. got it. Okay, now, okay, perfect, now. How do both of us share screen at the same time? Share the screen for just both share, of us. Just share the screen. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, here, I'm sharing a screen, okay? Correct. And, and 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 Renato, just talk. Don't don't do anything um, funny here. I think I think. Okay, one, two, three. It's better not to share the screen. Just share. Just leave the the, the camera image. Um, oh, you mean, you mean you, Renato, Renato? Are you talking about going to plan the the previous plan that we that we were talking about earlier? Uh, I think we are trying to do the the live. Yeah. So 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 that's okay. So right now, Renato. Uh, talk non-stop for the next 15 seconds and I'll continue to talk right now. Just, no, talk, just talking, just talking. Uh, keep, keep talking. talking. Okay, I both of us are going to be talking simultaneously at the same time and I don't hear you talking. You need to talk, Renato. I am talking, talking, talking. Okay, talking, talking, okay talking, don't talking, stop. Talking. Just keep going. Don't One, two, three. Yeah, yeah. Continuous talking. talking. Do not leave any space between the words. Just keep talking as you are. Blah, there. blah, 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 blah. Um, the guys in Saudi can see whether we are able to give you some. And you're talking. Uh, Dan, I hear him, blah, 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 and you were talking at the same time. Nobody is cutting nobody. So both of you guys can talk at the same time. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, you know, I mean, look, it's, uh, we can run the experiment. And uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. What can I tell you? <laughs> it, it, it will work. It will work because I hear Renato with the blah, 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 blah. And I hear you talking at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, very good. Well, I think we're, we're, I think we're in good shape then. Einstein, we very good. Experiment. Uh, can you please uh, not share anything? Because then uh, all the participants can see uh, all in gallery view all uh, the videos on at the same time. And then it will be smooth. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, you've uploaded. Um, is that a uh, that's a that's a custom image that you've uploaded there? Yes. Yes. I'm learning how to do this. This is nice. I'm in Ipanema Beach now in 1916, 1906. Okay. Um, and uh, oh, look at that. How about me? And you I, have I, something I, very nice. To say. I've, I've just gone to Iceland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Because they have very little COVID there. You have to wear a jacket. Yeah, 
<laughs> well, it's it's cold, but at least I, I don't feel, you know, like I have to do the social distancing because they're really in control of their COVID there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have a very nice one, Renato, there. <laughs> very nice. Yeah. So I think it's going to work. Do you want to okay. get a saxophone just for, for a quick thing? Uh, no, no, because that's, uh, that takes away the element of surprise. Yeah, okay. let's just start with the meeting again. We're ready. Uh, my friend Farhad, are you ready? Hi, Farhad. Farhad is mute him. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Hafizi. You mute him. Unmute myself. Okay. Super. Now it seems to work. So, um, okay. I, I like your background, Renato, and then uh, it's quite sophisticated. It, 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 it's good, isn't it? It, it, it has yours. It, yours the same. You I, don't. You do have the same. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know the thing is that those mountains they really don't move, no matter how hard the wind blows. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Um, so for, for the second part of the seminar, um. I will speak for a few more minutes uh, with uh, with another topic that we are submitting right now, and and then we will hear Mohammed Shafiq um, about uh, waveform guided PRK after crosslinking. We will have Shadi Awad, Susan Jacob, and Renato again with case presentation. So please, everybody, stay tuned. I think this will be an excellent replacement of what we uh, should have had uh, live in uh, in uh, in the KSA right now. So I will start. Let me see how. This looks better. So uh, this time I should be in my presentation right away. Yeah. Does it look good? Yes, it does. Okay. So um, we were intrigued by the recent developments around Bauman's membrane transplantation. So we started looking into the potential role of Bauman's uh, in coronal biomechanics. And when we went into PubMed, um, all we found basically was one publication from 1992 from Theo Seiler stating that Baumann's does not play a role, but um, the, the technology at the time, 28 years ago, was of course more limited than nowadays. So we thought, let's, let's revisit this whole Baumann's coronal biomechanics question with more, more up-to-date technology and measurement methods. Uh, I do not have any financial interests related to this uh, presentation. So the background, but I, what, what I would like to stress out is that um, the entire setup has been carried out by Emilio Torres, who has been my postdoc for two and a half, almost three years now. And he's just an excellent guy to have in the team. So as a background, if you open any textbook on, uh, um, on corneal collagen structure, it will tell you that the collagen fibers have to be ortho, orthogonally uh, arranged to allow for transparency and stiffness. But in fact, James Jester, 10 years ago, completely changed our view of, um, of lamellar orientation in the cornea because he was able to show that there is a lot of anastomosis going on between the anterior and the posterior stroma. And this lateral branching is very important for cornea. Yeah? Farhad, do you have any slides? Do you all your presentation because I only see you the video? I don't see any presentation, any slides. Interesting. Again, let me see. So, um, stop video. Oh, here. That's my. That's me. Wait. Share screen. I'm an idiot. I pressed the wrong button. So, this I thought you were giving me just an introduction. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. Let me see. And now I. See, uh, I only see. The right now yeah it's coming up um All right. thank you just just stop me immediately so here we are <laughs> okay do you see it now yes great okay so what i was uh, talking about is as you can see here in these double staining methods um that in fact the the collagen fibers are not orthogonally orientated they branch from the anterior to the posterior stroma and this has been something that, in fact, Baumann himself has already drawn in 1847, but has been forgotten for more than a century. 
And if you open up textbooks from the 1980s, 90s, even early 2000s, they will tell you, no, there is no, the, everything is nice and orthogonally and 90 degrees to each other uh, to preserve transparency, structure and uh, biomechanics. But apparently this is not the case. So you have fibers that run from the surface to the depth of the cornea. And, and this of course, uh, ask for the question, how is Bauman's layer implicated? Because many of these fibers, they, they start right in the basement membrane of Bauman's. So if we look into, as I said, if we look into PubMed and what had been published, uh, all you will find is a 1992 paper by Zeiler with a rather low N of uh, five human corneas in the experimental group and five human corneas in uh, the control group. And he basically, tried to, uh, he ablated a cornea to, to, uh, to an extent where there was no Baumanns present in the controls. And then he tested whether or not Baumanns has an implication and he found no implication. But you can imagine that a, that a structure so thin as Baumanns membrane can almost disappear in the background noise of an entire cornea being measured uh, with an extensiometer, ex vivo. So we thought, how could we do this again and uh, just measure a very thin lamella with or without Baumanns. And what we came up with is the following setup. The, 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 as I said, the background of our investigation was uh, were the recent publications by the Mellis group from uh, the Netherlands, showing that there might be a role for Baumann layer transplantation in stabilizing keratoconus. And I did not really understand why this should work but now I think I, I start understanding and, and I believe it's a scarring reaction and the scarring reaction must increase stiffness. It's not Bauman's layer, it's just something you implant into this pocket. So um, anyway, we still try to figure this out. So how can we analyze the biomechanical properties? We basically decided not to measure the entire cornea, but just to measure the thin lamella, makes more sense. So the way we produce these thin lamellas, in the first step, we had a Baumann's group, so the experimental group, and the anterior stroma control group. In the very first step, we simply removed the epithelium mechanically. That's easy. So we had two groups without the epithelium. In the next step, only in one group, we performed a 20 micrometer, 10 millimeter diameter PTK. So we ended up with two corneas, almost of the same thickness, one with Baumann's layer, one without Baumann's layer. And then we did a 110 micrometer flap with a mechanical microkeratoma. I think it was a Moria M2. And so in the end, we had thin lamellas with and without Baumann's of approximately the th same thickness. We of course took care of hydration during these experiments and not to have um, too many variations. And these were not porcelain corneas, these were human corneas that we received from Walter Secundo following uh, endothelial stripping for DMAC. So I bank corneas. So we looked at these two different groups in the stress strain extensiometer, and basically we found no difference. So if this is indeed the case, if there is no difference even in a thin lamella, and just to remind you, with this method, we are even able to measure cross-linking before and after in the mouse cornea, in a mouse cornea of one and a half millimeters. So I, 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 I quite believe the results here because we did not measure this in five corneas, but in, uh, I think it was 23 corneas per group. So in our eyes, Baumann's layer does not change the stiffness of these very thin lamellas. And this has implications to better understand the, the recent uh, Mellis group publications of Bauman layers transplantation. And if I understand well, Lamis Baidun, his former right hand, and now is our corneal consultant here at the Elsa Institute. And she told me that um, Mellis has just published another uh, work where he, where he implanted uh, a different collagenous structure into this, into this femto laser pocket other than Baumann's layer, and he also had flattening effect uh, due to scarring probably. So um, maybe this will help uh, elucidate some of the, or shine a different light on Baumann's layer. And I think we are perfectly safe to remove it when we, whenever we perform a PRK. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, uh, Farhan. Remember that you're in charge for the second part of this. Yes. So this was uh, the role of Bauman's membrane, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mohamed Shafiq Shaheen from uh, Alexandria, speaking on sequential wavefront-guided PRK after crosslinking, the recipe for visual rehabilitation for keratoconic patients. Hello. Oh yeah. Hello. Do you hear me? Hello, everybody. Are you hearing me? Te escuchamos, claro que sí. Te escuchamos. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning yes. for those who are on the other side yeah. of the, uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I'm going to share. Do you see me, or just do you hear me? We see you. Okay. So glad to see you, everybody and uh, to share with you my experience. Yes. Can you see my slide, my first slide, please? Can you see it? Yes, yes. So uh, I'm really very excited to share uh, my experience once again. And thank you, uh, Jose, for inviting me for the second time. Well, actually, the looking down brought to us a lot of knowledge while we're staying at home, and everybody can't dare to go out of home because of this very small virus. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I dare everybody to go out of home for the next few weeks, but hopefully we're going to learn from each other. So uh, simply, uh, my talk today is a continuation, I'm sorry. I want to remove this thing. How to remove the upper part? Stop. This thing in the up. Okay. What's so the, simply, the yeah, you're seeing it perfectly. Yeah, the transition is okay. It's good, but uh, you're still on the first screen. And the in you're you're not seeing my my third slide, which is is crosslinking enough for good vision? Yes. Right. Yes. So this is a question that we, we all know the, the answer for. It's not enough for good, for good vision, of course, and it's just a step. And from the results of my previous work, we see that the maximum changes regarding the K-max, if we take it as a parameter, a valid parameter, takes place in the first six months significantly. And afterwards, nothing of significant changes could happen after a normal cross-linking, and I'm still doing the classic Dresden protocol up till now. And again, for the maximum elevation, for the maximum posterior and anterior elevation, the same thing could happen in the first six months. All uh, uh, significant changes take place, and after one year, we're almost the same, having the impact on the uncorrected and best corrected visual acti. And the, these uh, are well demonstrated over my seven years outcome of the epithelium of corneal crosslinking that I published a couple of years ago, because every single important change takes place in the first six months. And after one year, after we, we have uh, our uh, patients examined and uh, looked for, uh, we, we, we have to answer his question, how are we going to improve his or her vision? Uh, to be honest enough, the ultimate goal of any cross-linking, good cross-linking, is just a, a, a cone shift and uh, uh, to reach what's called, oops, what's called a refractable eye. And by refractable eye, we mean an eye that we can measure uh, in a, with the stability, the sphere and cylinder, and even the higher order aberration. And the modify, by modifying the extreme irregularity in the pupil entrance is the main reason for the visual rehabilitation or the main uh, uh, way to uh, visually rehabilitate those patients. So in the past, and this slide dating back to, to 2013, various topo-guided or corneal wavefront-guided ablation pattern could be used in spite of their relative insufficiency. By that time, the low-definition aberrometers that we were using were not able to measure clearly and in a repeatable way the regular corneas. But by that time, also, I, I started to acquire the high-resolution aberrometer 
from the Johnson & Johnson was Abbott by that time. And uh, uh, of course, this barometer helped me as it helped many others around the world to measure uh, 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 with a precision the highly irregular cornea. And starting out a bit, I started to answer the question, could these barometers solve the problem of a highly irregular cornea? Actually, I led by that time a, a pilot study uh, tackling or addressing different pathologies of highly irregular cornea after previous RK, after corneal cross-linking, and after irregular LASIK or a decentered ablation. And uh, the results were really so encouraging that led me to a further study on the post-corneal cross-linking keratoconic eyes. And obviously, this is the most uh, common group that we encounter as a, as a regular cornea in our daily practice here in the Middle East and North Africa because of the high frequency of the keratoconus. Uh, by that time, I had 34 uh, 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 eyes uh, followed for one year using a protocol of uh, a, a, a sequential wafer-guided PRK with a mitomycin C after getting sure that the cornea was stable after one year and having a best corrected visual acuity of 0.3 or better and a corneal thickness of more than 100, of more than 400 micron in thickness with an age more than 21 years to guarantee more or less stability. And uh, the results were published in, in Cornea 2016, carrying a hope to improve the vision or to have related the vision for our keratoconic eyes after corneal cross-linking and the changing the protocol and it was a paradigm shift by that time. The results were really encouraging and this is in the logmar. If you see that the majority of the patients reached 0.14 logmar visual acti after one year and uh, in all and over the sample. And again, the total aberrometric data and breaking down the aberrometric value of the higher order aberration to coma, trifoil, and spherical aberration has improved a lot. Again, the, if we summarize the uh, corneal morphology data, we can find significant change in almost every single uh, corneal morphology data, except for very few irregularity indices. And uh, uh, to answer the question of the stability, we followed up the patient for one month, and it was really stable uh, regarding the KMAX and again regarding the uh, post-operative corneal pachymetry. Uh, uh, after uh, 12 months, we had a stable uh, best corrected visual acti and an overall uh, uncorrected visual acti of 2040 or more in 97 patient, uh, 97 percent of our patient. This is very encouraging results that uh, uh, could lead us to another protocol. And I'm going to show some uh, uh, of my examples. This is a case of a 24 year old lady who had uh, a, a, a corneal cross linking one uh, year ago before her presentation. And as you see, the manifest refraction was in the form of cylinder. Of course, it's not a true cylinder. It is a translation of the coma with the best corrected vision of only 0.3 and this kind of uh, central uh, thickness. And you see the highly irregular, the high irregularity in the center of the cornea after one year of corneal cross-linking. But we were able to measure the, the aberrometry of her and to get an aberrometric data, a reliable one, and you see the exuberant coma in such case. And out of this, you can create a, a dependable ablation profile using the, oh, sorry for that. This is the uh, dependable irregular ablation profile using, uh, empowered uh, by the uh, high definition aberrometer. You go simply and you remove the epithelium by using the amoils brush. And uh, of course, the amoils brush takes off all the epithelium even that was masking, uh, and then uh, do the PRK powered by the uh, 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 aberrometric data and terminating with a mitomycin C for 20 seconds. And of course, the uh, results could uh, uh, be, uh, as you see, uh, a central uh, uh, regulation, uh, regularity of the central part of the cornea. Of course, in such kind of patients, you can't seek uh, uh, perfection, but you uh, you will provide the patient with more or less a regular uh, pupil entrance, and uh, of course this will be translated into uh, the uh, uh, improvement of the uncorrected visual acuity in such a condition it reached 0.7 and the best corrected vision of one. 
something that you can never achieve with any kind of keratoplasty and simply by removing the noxious uh, irregularity of the cornea that lead to a higher order aberrations. Uh, you see the irregularity in this has improved from uh, uh, the uh, uh, post uh, uh, in the proposed operative from a uh, preoperative that were all in red and now the numbers are much better than used before again there is nothing uh, 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 ideal in such cases but you seek the regulation of the cornea and getting a good point spread function in such case as you see compared with the other one Another case, and I bring this case because in such condition, the patient had a thicker cornea after one year of corneal cross-linking, and again, a higher sphere and cylinder. And again, this corneal thickness allows me to, to do is the same thing. This is the cornea after one year, and this is the reading using the aberrometric data. And again, you generate an irregular ablation profile to address the higher order aberration and the irregularity of the cornea. And at the same time, the sphere and cylinder. And again, with an, uh, a perfect manifest refraction afterwards that had its impact on both uncorrected and discorrected visual acti. In such condition, I removed 75 microns of, of, of the cross-linked uh, stroma. And I'll come back to this. Uh, again, this is the pre-op and this is the post-op and again more regular cornea and a better spread, uh, point spread function. Well, we have here to stop and to give the credit to John Canalopoulos that he allowed us or opened the door to ablate uh, a, a keratoconic eye uh, by doing a PRK, which was at uh, that time a kind of taboo. But uh, uh, this was in the year 2009. And uh, afterwards, a lot of publication came out in the favor of what's called Athens Protocol, which is a simultaneous PRK, a topo-guided PRK, with corneal with, with, with uh, cross-linking at the same time, a simultaneous one. Nowadays, I can say that I don't use Athens Protocol anymore. And instead of that, I use my protocol that was developed by uh, myself and the group that I'm leading, which is a sequential uh, uh, wavefront-guided PRK uh, 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 after one year of corneal cross-linking. I first do a corneal cross-linking and I wait for one year and then I do a, a wavefront guided PRK with mitomycin C and I have a lot of uh, issues uh, to debate this and to say why sequential and not simultaneous and why wavefront guided and not topo guided uh, 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 for such kind of patients for visual rehabilitation after corneal cross-linking. Well, uh, uh, Simply because the uh, Niels Bohar, who is a, a Nobel Prize winner, say an expert is a person who has made all the mistakes that can be made in a very narrow field. And actually, I have a lot of these mistakes. A Nobel Prize winner say an expert is a person who has made all the mistakes that can be made in a very narrow field. And actually, I have a lot of these mistakes. A Nobel Prize winner say an expert is a person who has made all the mistakes. Can be made in a very narrow Hello? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So, so first of all, uh, uh, why why sequential and not simultaneous PRK? Because a sequential, uh, a simultaneous one, is too invasive. It's too invasive and a kind of double insult to our cornea. And by that, we had a lot of cases with bilateral delayed epithelial healing for weeks that puts the patient in danger of infection or even scarring, or both of them. And that's why, and this was the first cause why I abandoned Athens protocol or simultaneous one. And second, in the simultaneous uh, protocol, we don't take into consideration the effect of the corneal cross-linking. And as I showed before in many of my cases, that in, uh, sometimes you had an exaggerated effect of the corneal cross-linking after a year in such a very high flattening. In such condition, it will lead to a hypropic shift with the excess flattening. And some of the cases ended up with a high hypropic uh, a refractive error that had no way to treat it. That's why, again, I'm refrained from, uh, uh, I'm refraining now from doing a simultaneous protocol. And second, the simultaneous protocol does not address the emmetropia 
or even the near emetropia, while in the uh, sequential one, I can tackle the sphere and cylinder if they are low and the corneal thickness allows, and at the same time, correcting the higher order aberration and regularize the central cornea. In such condition, if you're doing a simultaneous protocol, you might go back and do another PRK afterwards, which is again, not very precise and uh, doesn't go with the uh, uh, logic thinking. And then the drawbacks of the topo-guided ablation profiles themselves. First of all, the majority of the topo-guided uh, uh, profiles are depending on a placido disc, which does not measure the center. And this is a kind of crude concept of the cause-effect relationship, because the cause lies in the center. And if we are to correct the patient's problem, we have to address the proper center and we have to measure it properly, something that the wavefront guided technology can do it easily. And so for me, a topo-guided ablation profile is like killing an ant with a sledgehammer. You use a, a very tool, big tool. And even uh, when they started to use it uh, in the very early beginning, Gustavo Tamayo, I caught this from Gustavo Tamayo in the year 2001, he said that the topo-guided ablation is a crude concept of the cause-effect relationship. Uh, even Canalopolis himself, in his publication in the year 2009, he stated that we have been able to use a topography guided treatment in highly illegal cornea that were beyond the limits of a wavefront guided uh, or uh, machines or measuring. And so he was not able to have, and uh, he attempted the wavefront first and he was not able to do so. This is, was absolutely true in the year 2009. But now we can have a better address for the cause effect relation using a wave, a wave front guided ablation profile, and we can address the central or the pupil entrance irregularity and uh, wipe or regularize the main cause of the visual degradation using, uh, if you can measure them by a kind of, a, of, uh, of the high definition abrometer, you can address them and you can have a proper addressing to the cause effect relationship. We know that the wave front sensors have a unique precision in measuring the whole pupil entrance and making a dependable ablation profile based on the regular uh, 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 pupil entrance to modify it, uh, compensating for the cyclotorsion uh, uh, precisely and compensating for the pupil centroid shift and uh, relating this kind of map or ablation profile to the out boundaries of the uh, 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 limbus and not relating it to the uh, pupil. This is a precise aiming of the map because we have uh, uh, to have our ablation beam, uh, sorry for that, it's beam not beat, has to hit the peak of the trough and but if it, uh, the peak of the uh, of the irregularity, but if it has it, it hits the trough by mistake, it could lead to an irregular, more irregularity. And I quote this cartoon from my uh, uh, dear friend, uh, Shadi Awad, who gave me his, this cartoon, but this is to show how our beam uh, using to, uh, to regularize the cornea should be very precise to hit the peak and not the trough. And this could be really done by if you are empowered by a kind of machine that measured properly the irregularity and address properly the irregularity. Again, uh, uh, to be honest enough, uh, there are uh, some drawbacks or some uh, 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 claiming from uh, Canalobulus by that time that simultaneous, that uh, is superior to sequential technique because of three reasons. The combination reduces the patient time away from work. It's performing both procedures at the same time with a topographic guided PRK first, appear to minimize the potential superficial stromal scarring result from PRK. And then if you are removing the co uh, corneal cross-linked tissue, you are uh, 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 allowing uh, for the progression of the keratoconus. For that reason, I have my guidelines for the sequential protocol. I know that we are ablating a cross-linked tissue, so I don't ablate more than 15% of the central corneal thickness. I leave my cornea at more than 400 micron, and I keep close follow-up on the keratoconic progression that uh, uh, if you find a single or a very subtle uh, tendency to progression after this protocol, you might go and do a recross linking again. Uh, 
these are my guidelines for this protocol. And to finish up with, the conclusion is the sequential PRK for the keratoconic eyes seems to be a better alternative than simultaneous one, uh, as it addresses precisely the visual rehabilitation after having the maximum effect of corneal cross-linking, and the precisely positioned excimer beam laser could hit exactly the irregularities that we are aiming to, to regularize the pupil entrance. With the modern technology, you can measure these irregularities, and you can get out of it using a high, uh, 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 a high definition aberrometer, you can uh, uh, get out of it a dependable ablation profile and you can go and regularize it provide, to provide your patient uh, a, a very good vision using his or, own, or her own cornea without having the need to go for any kind of uh, keratoplasty. Um, Many works are now being done to do to uh, uh, prove my points of view. This is uh, a nice publication from my fellow Dr. Shalabi. He's working now in the United Kingdom and he's following my steps because we've worked together and he published recently a nice publication that the outcome of the sequential cross-linking of the sequential PRK after cross-linking uh, uh, is better than the simultaneous one. And again, a lot of publication dealing with the same thing using a different uh, 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 ablation profile like the corneal wolfram guided PRK and I think Dr. Awad will address this topic after me. Uh, if Renato is still there with us, I, I have very good news for you Renato because the Violet uh, June uh, campaign will continue in the Arab world as I just translated your uh, very nice uh, booklet for the patient education for those uh, 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 for the, with these uh, ideas and uh, 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 basic information for the patients to don't rub his eyes or her eyes with a keratoconus, and it's going to be diffused in the all Arab worlds soon, thanks to uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies who will take care of the printing. Again, if you are attending uh, this year's Amsterdam meeting, and I hope it will be uh, on its time, and we are uh, uh, going to relieve from this nightmare of the coronavirus, please, uh, you're more than welcome to attend my uh, uh, course. Uh, and uh, uh, lucky enough, I have this course maintained on the podium of the Iskers for 12 consecutive years. We have Theo Seiler, Farhat Hafizi, Siham Nazareg, and Michael Bellin, and Jose Guel and myself in this course. Uh, uh, we'll be very happy to see you there all. And again, it was a great chance to be looked uh, uh, down in our homes to contemplate this very nice view from my balcony in Alexandria. Hope to see you all in Alexandria one day, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Great, uh, thank you very much, dear Mohammed. I just saw that I was unmuted. This was extremely interesting and we will have the discussion in the very end. Now, just a, one a small request to all moderators and to, um, the, um, to the technical support, please could you uh, give me the freedom to mute and unmute myself? It would be uh, very useful. And to all the other moderators, we have many, many questions and answered. I didn't see them before, I, I realized them. And so I'm answering as many as I can. The other moderators, Dan, uh, Renato, please uh, look at Q&A and answer all questions that uh, are um, uh, directed to your talks. And just one more remark, Mohammed, if, if you tell me that exaggerated cross-linking will make my belly that flat, I will go for it. <laughs> we will try it. Because <laughs> we will have such a big belly after, after looking down in, uh, in our homes. Okay, so let's move on to the next presentation, which will be given uh, by our dear friend Shadi Awad from AUB in Beirut, latest trends in customized corneal ablation in keratoconus. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. Can I just share my screen as such? Let me see. Um, just press the green button on the bottom of yeah. your screen. Green arrow. Okay. Can you guys see the first slide? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. 
So um, I would just like to start first by thanking Jose and Kay Cash for inviting me to participate in this wonderful meeting among stellar speakers. I, for one, has benefited, have benefited a lot, so um, thank you for this opportunity. I do not have any financial interest in the subject matter. Um, so why doing custom ablation in catechonus patient, and is it okay? Well, if we respect the fact that we should not treat but mainly higher order aberration, and this is not a refractive procedure, treating the essential lower order aberrations only as well, then yes, for sure. The issues with custom treatment, as we all know in general, and specifically also for keratoconus, is overcorrection, which I'm not gonna go in the details, biomechanical insult to the cornea, remodeling that happens and bring about more refractive errors and more uh, aberrations. And finally, haze that can sometimes negate the very uh, reason why we're doing this uh, procedure. Now, uh, for that reason, we should bear in mind that we need to outsource the preoperative higher order aberration and outsource as much as possible postoperative low order aberrations. So preoperatively, if, if we uh, outsource some of those aberrations, especially in very advanced aberrated eyes to cornea ring segments or cares, that would be great because then we will be fine tuning whatever remaining of these aberrations into an ablative procedure. So outsource into an additive and then go ahead and ablate so that you can do the least treatment uh, possible. How about outsourcing postoperative lower order aberrations, like whatever that can be corrected by spectacles or contact lenses, fake IOLs, or also leave enough room for possible revisiting the cornea and now treating the cornea more accurately because the higher order aberrations are being taken care of. And that's why, roughly speaking, um, if we combine uh, custom ablation with cross linking, whether sequential or whether uh, done combined, we can basically do one of four. One would be ocular wavefront guided. And even though it's a holistic uh, method because it measures the total ocular wavefront, it's limited by pupil size. And they, I think this is essential in uh, keratoconus treatment. And it's limited in resolution unless we're using pyramidal system, which are less likely to have aliasing for highly aberrated corneas. Another con is that the potential to treat unnecessary internal and changing aberrations. Topography guided, the pros is that it gets everything that is the cornea, and that's the most important thing. The, the con is lacks, it lacks refraction data, so we have to guesstimate a little bit. It's a little bit rigid in terms of aberration selection, but uh, other than that, it's fine. Corneal wavefront guided is topography guided. Uh, it also lacks refraction data. We have to guesstimate. Um, the only pro is that it can allow for some flexibility treating some aberrations. So we, we go ahead with topography. We uh, uh, produce a wavefront map, and we can sometimes select our ablation, allowing for some trimming of the ablation, which we can still do with topography guided if we play with refraction. And finally, PTK ablation. And now I think with epithelial mapping, PTK is getting even more uh, uh, accurate and useful because we can look at the difference in epithelium between cone and non-cone and treat the PTK accordingly. It allows for partial treatment of aberration, maybe half the cone or quarter of the cone. So half the coma, quarter of the coma can be treated and not the full coma. Uh, it is more tissue saving, but it has, it's not holistic. It has less control on aberration and less impact on refraction. And of course, who are the best candidates to treat? They're candidates that are intolerant to hard lenses and they have suboptimal vision. So remember, we need to remember this is not a refractive procedure. We're not aiming for emetropia. It would be nice to have it. I'm not saying no, but it would be, uh, it's not our main aim. And that in mind, would we do combine or would we do sequential? I'm not gonna address that because I know we're gonna, have, we're gonna hear a lot of different opinions, but I think both can be fine as long as in our mind, we are individualizing. I know for a fact that a great study by Farhad where we know that the cornea after cross-linking can remodel massively and produce sometimes uh, uh, great scars that can produce massive flattening, as you can see here, like more than 15 diopters of flattening. So if we're doing combined together, which I do as well for patients, as well as I doing sequential, I should not target the lower order aberration because I don't know how the cornea is gonna behave, but I can target higher order aberration and as low as possible. Again, the less, the better here. So if I'm targeting emetropia, yes, it's a big mistake. All right, how about the haze? We, we do hear that we have a lot of haze in both procedures, but more so 
in uh, the combined and the sequential. Again, John Canelapus and again, uh, George Kimionis have set the path for that. And for them at the time, the haze was accepted. Not much haze was there. But Marconi Santiago, again, in another recent paper, showed that there is a lot of haze when you combine them together. And the haze is not some epithelial that you see in PRK. It's actually deep in the anterior stroma. And as we see here, more than 23% had grade two haze, 4% grade three, and about more than 50% of patients lost one or two lines of vision. But if you look exactly at what happened, Marconi San Diego looked at patients who had 40 second, up to 40 second mitomycin C treatment. Uh, again, another study by Candelopoulos, a 10 year follow up for their outcome showed no haze. And a lot of other studies for Hani Sakla, for Mazen Sinjab, that actually show no haze as well. Bruce Allen in, in, in London, no haze when you combine them together. Why is this discrepancy? So if you look at why, I could find one thing. The mitomycin C used in the Athens protocol was 20 seconds. The one used by Marconi Santiago was 40 seconds. The one with Bruce Allen, zero, no mitomycin C used. So we looked at our data, looking at the OCT and triosoma reflectivity using a dedicated software with artificial intelligence and looking at the Dresden protocol, retrospectively Dresden with PRK and mitomycin C and Dresden with mitomycin C alone. You might think this is a foolish idea, but that's the interesting thing is what we got out of it. So after crossing it by itself, we have some haze there. After PRK and cross thinking at three months, we have a whopping haze of 32.12 in terms of reflectivity by OCT. However, after cross linking with mitomycin C alone, we have 24.3%, way more than the 15.85 uh, uh, or 16 uh, with the regular cross linking. If we look at the difference between PRK and the Dresden plus and mitomycin C, there is still a difference. But I believe that this might be due also because of we're ablating Bowman's here and we have more cross-linking. So what's going on here? We do believe that mitomas and C kills even more keratocytes. And this actually inflicts much more insult to the cornea. You have a massive release of cytokines, which will lead to a dramatic haze and more haze formation. Interestingly, by the way, the Cross-linking with the mitomycin C had more flattening in their K-max than the cross-linking alone. But the haze that developed and kept developing, by the way, up to a year, actually negated their vision. So they came up with the worst vision than the cross-linking alone. So for me, what, after we got down to these data, I don't, I don't use mitomycin C when I combine my treatment. And I think from there, the, the haze significantly dropped. So we still do get haze, but it's significantly dropped. That is the software we use. It's already online and soon it will be available for everybody. And as you see, it will automatically detect the demarcation line. As you see here, it's set at 274 and it will automatically detect the anterior mid stromal and posterior haze as you see down. It will give you all kind of uh, percentages and you can follow, you can export to CSV and Excel. It can do a follow up in statistics. So the next thing I wanna talk about are the technologies. Now, uh, among the technology I would like to talk about is pyramidal aberrometry. And uh, in here, there's a pyramid, it's called also Osiris. Uh, a lot of people have it as Osiris uh, or Pyramus, and it's a placido and pyramidal aberrometry. The pyramidal aberrometry will allow for a very high uh, uh, dense uh, definition uh, aberrometry up to 45,000. And we have the placido plus OCT system, and in here it's MS39, which Dan has talked about before and showed some amazing uh, images. So again, both can be used diagnostically and therapeutically, but with the MS39, I think, or any other OCT, I, mean, I think there are much more that we can uh, use, and that's what I'm going to discuss in a minute. So if you look at the pyramids or the pyramidal aberrometry, because it has placido plus it has aberrometry, we can look at the ocular, we can look at the corneal derived from the placido, and we can subtract them together on the same uh, machine and get the internal. The internal heat is posterior curvature all the way to lens to, to vitreous and everything. So this is not true internal, it's posterior curvature all the way in. And again, remember this is high resolution uh, aberrometry up to 45,000 points on the large pupil size, of course. And definitely we have less aliasing in those very highly aberrated eyes. So we can look at, um, sorry. so we can look at um, the ocular, we can look at anterior cornea and we can look at internal at the same time in every single aberrometry we can look at. Uh, now, the importance of having OCT 
is that, as Dan has shown, uh, this is an in, in, uh, epithelium from the MS39. And as you see, this is one day off contact lenses. This is two weeks off contact lenses. And you can see the huge difference between the two maps uh, together. More importantly, this is a patient with one diopter up uh, on the anterior curvature, down is the epithelium thickness. The other eye of the same patient has 2.5 diopters of astigmatism, but look at the epithelium. You have a lot of epithelial toricity here. And in that case, doing trans epithelial PRK is much better than just removing the epithelium in a mechanical way or alcohol way because it has less impact to produce a sudden uh, residual stromal astigmatism. Better pachymetry. If we look at this patient post crosslinking and we look at uh, the pachymetry, of course, because of the haze, we have a lot of scatter. So we have a thinner cornea by uh, Scheinfluch. This is by OCT. And on the left side by Scheinfluch, 368 and 308. And this is quite important in planning. If you're planning to perform uh, PRK post a crosslinking, a crosslinked eye, that's very important to know exactly what you're treating. Um, Again, better posterior float. That's a patient with a disc scar in the anterior stroma. Look at the shine float, posterior elevation. It's 18, it has a bump in the posterior elevation, but look at the OCT, there's no bump, everything is clear. Remember, a lot of our patients has that cross-linking before, they have scattered scars. We will be reading an abnormal posterior elevation and abnormal posterior curvature, let alone abnormal posterior aberration. And that's why this brings me to the posterior aberration. So being able to have a better technology to scan the posterior float will give you a better aber posterior surface aberration than the shine float cameras. So that's why I think OCT is an important and very exciting technology to incorporate into our customized treatments. An example is this case where we have this in the MS39 uh, section and in here is epithelial uh, mapping. And as you see, you have a lot of thickness where actually the cone, uh, 180 degree diameter uh, opposite to the cone. This is the anterior curvature. This is the posterior instantaneous curvature. So this patient has had cross thinking before and he has some corneal haze as you notice here. 2050 vision, but by RGP, the patient is getting 2020. We wanted to treat very minimally, as much as possible, some of the higher order aberrations. Remember, he has already haze. If you look at the if you look at the OCT and plastic system, if you look at the anterior coma, we see that it's 0 0.86. The posterior coma is 0 0.49, 41, but the total coma in here is actually 0 0.43, which means if we're gonna do a regular anterior topography guided, we're gonna eliminate the 0 0.86. So what we will end up is 0 0.41 that will show up. And remember it's at 180 degree diametrically opposite from the coma. So it is negating the anterior coma. Again, if we look at the pyramids, which is the aberrometry, same thing, we don't have any surprise and same thing happens as you see here. So in that specific patient, we decided to go with ocular waveform guided and not topography guided. Why is that? Because topography right now, we're limited with anterior topography. And we know that the posterior topography is almost offsetting the anterior. By doing the anterior, we will unveil the posterior aberrations and then we're gonna have the same coma, 0 0.4. So what happened to the patient? This is the pre-op instantaneous curvature. This is the post-op. So we can still see some of the cone in here. But let us check and see what the OCT is showing. So if you look at OCT, we can see that even though the anterior higher order aberrations are still 0 0.4 diopter, but the total is now zero. The total corneal aberration, anterior and posterior is zero because still the posterior is 0 0.44 diametrically opposite 283 from the 90 that we have still on the anterior. So we did not achieve perfect anterior surface. We achieved perfect total topography, if you want to, or tomography, if you want to think of it, the total tomography. And actually, Bruce Allen has illustrated this concept very nicely in his uh, GCRS paper two years ago, doing combined ocular wavefront guided uh, with cross-linking. And what he noticed that in the same setting, he calculated what would have been if he did corneal wavefront guided, which is an analog to topography, and he found 44% less tissue, so more tissue saving when you do the ocular waveform. And that's because the coma and the tree four, because of the negative meniscus of the anterior chamber are negating the anterior surface. And that's why you end up with less treatment, less tissue. Now, is this the best treatment? No, I'm not saying that. Or what I'm saying that we have to keep in mind that sometimes we can save more tissue, precious tissue in these keratoconic patients by doing ocular waveform, should the pupil size be fine, Number one, and should be we should be uh, if we're using a high uh, definition uh, uh, pyramidal system or a high definition aberrometry. 
But how about doing total corneal wave front? Of course, garbage in, garbage out. If we're gonna do total corneal, it would be ideal, but we need not a shine plug, we need the no CT, at least for the time being, to perform it. And a very quick case where this is a keratotonic patient, again, as you notice, it has 3.5 diopter of anterior corneal coma. But if you look at, this is by aberrometry, but if you look at the ocular aberrometry, 0.14. That's very interesting, 3.4, 3.5 on the anterior, but 0.14 on the ocular. Same optical zone, all. Look at the internal, it's 3.58. Can it be from the posterior curvature? 3.58 at 262, so basically 180 degree negating the anterior corner. Let's look at the aberrometry. And with aberrometry, uh, sorry, let's look at OCT, the to MS-39 total corneal OCT. So what we see here, the coma, anterior coma is 3.16, just like we saw with the aberrometry but with posterior coma only 0.59. Now this means that we have a huge amount of coma that is deeper than the posterior curvature, potentially in the, lentic, in the lens. Now, if you look again at the topography and compare the red free image with the topography, we see that there is a, in, 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 a, a lower distance for the visual axis, like an angle alpha, an angle kappa is high, as if the patient is trying to peek through his cone. And this reminds me again of a study for Zoltan Negi, where uh, it's called the, in ophthalmology, the shifting of the line of sight. So what the patient is doing here, the patient is trying to look through the cone to minimize the coma and increase the spherical aberration on the expanse of the coma. But if we remember, the lens itself is, has a spherical aberration and the young negative and the old positive. So if we have a decenter spherical aberration, that's coma itself. And if it's 180 degree from the anterior coma, that's exactly negating it. The patient might negate it completely or might negate it uh, uh, partially. So again, we've done a study based on this using both uh, the MH39 and the Paramus and looking at all the catatonic patients. And we, we noticed that 5% of eyes have more than one diopter of true internal, so past the posterior curvature. I'm not talking about posterior curvature, everything inside, more than one diopter of coma, about 4.5 have more than one diopter of trefoil. And that's important, which means even though we really care about treating the the ocular, the, the corneal, and ideally the total corneal uh, aberrometry or the total corneal uh, uh, tomography, that what is more important also is to look for those patients, maybe in these categories of patients, an ocular wavefront might be fine. Now, whether treating topography guided will shift the line of sight back to the initial state, we don't know depending on the plasticity of the patient. So in conclusion, we definitely know that we can improve our customization by using OCT tomography and a higher definition aberrometry. It will be more holistic, will have new dimension to explore. It's not just uh, uh, topography or, or, or ocular wavefront, it can be anterior corneal, it can be selective anterior corneal or topography, it can be ocular wavefront guided, it can be no wavefront guided or a PTG. Uh, pure PTK. So we have all those options open. We, uh, we have to individualize. The OCT is so important for the epithelial data and to have a better pachymetry data, especially in those aberrated eyes. It has a better posterior aberration, so it is the way to go to treat total corneal aberrations. And uh, finally, more importantly, I think, just like any photographer who really doesn't like people telling him or telling her the photos are amazing, which camera do you have? Well, it is the photographer. We as clinician, we have those amazing devices, but we are the ones that have to be to make the final decision and the final treatment for the right patient. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Shavi. I think these are exciting news and uh, I personally had a, had a glimpse of insight into the OCT data and this is, this is absolutely, absolutely, I think it will be absolutely a game changer. Um, before we proceed to the next presentation, I see that um, some of the panelists have already started answering, uh, answering the questions and answers, and uh, Jose Vargas has asked me, each of the panelists, please look at the Q&A panel uh, below and pick one or two of the questions that were specifically addressed to you, and we will answer these questions in the discussion round in the very end. So uh, let's move forward to the next presentation. Now, I lost the overview here, I have it back. So the next presentation will be given by Susan Jacobs, again, Cares for Keratocomas. Susan, are you ready? Can you hear Susan? Hear you, can you hear me? Yes, oh, perfect. Can you hear? Yes. Great. All right. Farhad, uh, 
Uh, okay, uh, can you see my screen as well? Yes, we see your screen. All right, thank you. So, um, do you do you not see my PowerPoint slide? Is that seen? Uh, we can Hello? see the we can see the title slide now. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So, okay. Uh, Jose, again, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is uh, really a beautiful initiative that you've taken in these days when all of us are just shut in indoors. Uh, I already gave my first talk on contact lens assisted cornu cross-linking for those who were unable to attend that. And I did see the Q&As just now and I will try to answer uh, as many as I can. Uh, the second talk that I'm giving is on corneal allogenic intrastromal ring segments or CARES and uh, um, uh, this is something that I have a patent pending for, for special trifines, devices and processes used to create these segments, as well as for uh, process care segments and various uh, types of shaped corneal segments. So for those of you who might know about this procedure, uh, uh, this is similar to the intrastromal uh, ring segments, the ICRS, but most of these ICRS are artificial. In fact, all of them are, which are available at present. And you can see that uh, they are known to be associated with the a varying number of complications, right, from migrations, intrusions, extrusions, melts, corneal necrosis, having to take them out, all the way even up to infections, uh, infectious keratitis, and so on and so forth. So they've been reported to have even up to a 30% rate of complications, and many of them have to be explanted. Uh, there have been various reports uh, about CARES. Uh, CARES, we had published it first in Journal of Refractive Surgery. And uh, it's because of these complications uh, that uh, I would see often with my intacts or caring patient that I thought that if there would be something that was better to replace uh, synthetic segments, that would be good. And the uh, obvious answer that my mind went to was for uh, was with corneal tissue, since I'm also a corneal surgeon and I do handle a lot of uh, pure cornea cases. So uh, I thought about uh, how you could possibly put corneal tissue into these uh, uh, intralamellar channels, intrastromal channel. And, uh, and I was trying this out and I finally came up with a solution. So now there are various doctors who are doing this procedure around the world. Cares, Shady Award, uh, who you just heard that brilliant, brilliant talk is one of the most brilliant uh, possibly people who has a very, very deep and uh, knowledge. And you would, have, you would have understood that from his talk. His knowledge about the eye and the cornea and the operation in keratoconosis is uncomparable. And he's also been doing some of these cases. Maybe he'll pitch in a little later. Uh, there are also many other doctors around the world, including U.S. and other parts of the world who've started doing this now, U.S., uh, Dominican Republic, South Africa, and a few other countries. So um, here's how this procedure is done. This is a double-bladed trifine, which I have designed. And that's the donor corneal tissue. And this is the kind of ring that you get from punching this out. So in my next video, I'll show you. Is my video running, Farhad? Hello? The could you see my video play? I see it. Uh, can, you, can you start it? Oh, I, 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 the, there's one video that I already played. Yes, this played. I thought you were talking about the other one. It is a little bit uh, slow, but it plays well. You can see everything. Okay, so here it is. That's a double-bladed trifine. And I'm just pausing and going so that in case it's buffering, you will be able to get it as well. So this is the uh, care segment that is prepared from this double-bladed trifine. And that's what the segment looks like. So uh, here's how I do the procedure. This is a donor corneoscleral rim, which has been put into an artificial anterior chamber. I'm sorry. Uh, you don't really need to put into an artificial anterior chamber, except for, for just, it's just for the purpose of removing the epithelium completely. So here's how you do it. I make sure that I remove all the epithelium from the donor cornea, all the endothelium. That is the double-bladed trifine. We center it on the... Uh, donor corneoscleral rim and punch it out. And you get this uh, rim of pure uh, donor stroma. So it has neither the epithelium nor the endothelium. I'm sorry, I, this just keeps moving from slide to slide. <coughs> so I'll come back here. You've got this uh, ring of stromal tissue. I cut this ring of stromal tissue into two. These are uh, arc-shaped uh, instruments that I've just modified from cataract instruments. It's a Y rod just cut it to the shape of the cornea, I mean, bent it to the shape of the cornea, and you can see how that uh, intrastromal ring just easily slides in. This is donor corneal tissue. This is the tissue that question that I'm always asked whenever I present this, how do you manage to get it and how does it go in? Because we are all so used to pushing that intax in, you know, and intax is rigid, that inter artificial ICRS are rigid. But here, <coughs> excuse me, here you can see what I do is I get the initial part in and this arc-shaped uh, Y rod has 
me to push more of it in. And then I just slide it in and you can see how it goes into that uh, laser dissected channel. So obviously the femtosecond laser dissected channel was already prepared in the patient's eye. I've got two openings, two entry incisions for it uh, opposite each other, 180 degrees opposite each other. So for dragging it into position after initially pushing it in, I use a reverse Sinsky uh, from the opposite side, as you'll see here, cut off trim of the excess and uh, get it into its final position. Remove the epithelium, and uh, if it's a patient where I also need to do cross-linking, then I can continue with cross-linking. So uh, this, unfortunately, this video doesn't play because it's in a different uh, uh, format, but I'll show you another video of uh, a post-op patient. Here it is. These are the intracorneal uh, cares, the corneal allogenic intrastromal ring segments. And you can see two of them, one superior and one inferior. So what are the disadvantages of synthetic implants? One, of course, is the complications that we already mentioned about. And anyone who's been doing these for long knows that every once in a while you come up with a patient, uh, you know, post-operative period, delayed post-operative period who has this necrosis, you are often forced to take it out and so on and so forth. Also, the other problem is that you need a minimum stromal thickness of 450 microns in the zone of implantation. So without 450 microns, it's really not safe to do uh, intacts or Kera rings. So you cannot, by default, put these segments into very thin or very steep corneas that are beyond a certain limit. And also, since you need to have at least 400 microns of stroma above artificial segments, above anything that's plastic that's put into the eye, so that it doesn't, or at least it, it still doesn't completely remove complications, but at least to try and decrease the incidence of complications, you need to implant these uh, plastic segments deep. And the problem with that is you have to go at about 70 to 80% depth of the cornea and thereby you might have a limited effect of the, uh, uh, that the segment produces. Also, of course, we know that it's contraindicated in patients with autoimmune and immunodeficiency disorders and so on and so forth. And also for every artificial ICRS, you need FDA approval for a different thickness and a different arc length. Now, when you're doing CARES instead, well, the advantages that it has is it's biocompatible and biointegrable, so it avoids all complications. It can be implanted in thinner and steeper corneas, so you can do it in advanced cases because it's pure allogenic tissue. You know that when you do a DAL, you put uh, about 500, 520 microns of uh, donor stroma right onto the base, which is just pre-decimates, decimates, and endothelium. So you can definitely implant it in any uh, advanced case as well, as long as you can make an intrastromal channel with the femtosecond laser. So you can implant it in thick and uh, in thin and steep corneas. At the same time, you can also implant it in thick and less steep cornea, so you can cover almost the entire gamut of keratoconic patients right from advanced to mild and early cases, and I'll show you examples later on. Uh, you can implant it more superficial, so you can get a greater effect, so you're not forced to implant it at 70 to 80% depth. You can have an arc segment of about 360 degrees, which can be easily implanted. So these are all advantages. You have a much lower risk of complications. And as I already said, you can do it in every kind of cornea, uh, keratoconus, which is advanced and late. And the nomograms allow the use of, uh, of this procedure in different kinds of cases. So uh, almost all patients with keratoconus do need to undergo some treatment, generally cross-linking. You can also combine in these patients' cares simultaneous with cross-linking. If you've got an already cross-linked patient, you can put in care still to try and improve the uncorrected and best corrected visual acuity further. You can also implant it in patients who have no documented progression, again, to improve visual acuity. And of course, you can also put it in other causes of, care, of, of uh, ectasia, corneal ectasia. And most importantly, you can also use it to treat melts, migration, extrusion, intrusion, et cetera, that is related to synthetic segment implantation. So here's a classical picture, which all of us who deal with keratoconus will come across every once in a while. This is a an intact segment with an overlying corneal melt. And you can see that this is the post-op uh, picture. And I'll just show you how I manage this case. So uh, Farad, please let me know if my video doesn't run at any point of time. So if you can see that anterior segment OCT right there. All right, just, just let me know if anything is going wrong. So you can, you can see that anti-segment OCT there with a, a lot of uh, stromal thinning on top. That segment is almost, it's completely exposed. So here's the uh, care segment being prepared, as I showed you earlier, the same way. And once you do that, you remove this uh, bit of stromal tissue. You go back to the patient's eye. You can see that there's some amount of epithelial covering over the intact segment. So, so the actual amount of melt is much more than what it actually appears to be. That's the true extent of melt. Now, once you remove that epithelium, you go ahead. What I do is I go and uh, uh, get this segment out because I don't want it there exposed to the environment uh, since it's going to carry a potential risk of uh, infectious keratitis. So once I've removed that, I put my care segment over that area of milk. 
mark out the size that I would need. And then I cut the segment into two halves longitudinally. And then I just push it, it, push it in into that area of melt. And I put two anchoring sutures, one on either side. So I've got that in there. I've got two anchoring sutures, one on either side. And then I put these bridging sutures over the segment in the middle so that it just holds that segment underneath the suture and prevents the segment from popping out. So these sutures, which you're seeing now are not going through the care segments, but just over it. They're bridging sutures in essence. And basically that's, that's the end of the case. If you have fibrin glue, you can apply a little bit of fibrin glue there. I did that. Put a bandage contact lens. If you don't have fibrin glue, it shouldn't matter. Here's a post-operative appearance of the patient. And, uh, and here is about uh, three months post-op, I think, uh, with the sutures in situ. And then once the sutures were removed, and you can see this is an eye with an intact segment on one side and the other side where the exposed uh, uh, extruded, uh, eroded intact segment was removed. And this is replaced with a cast segment on the lower side. So that's, that's, uh, that was an interesting case, which I thought I would share with you. Now, other than this, other than intact smells, I've also done them in um, uh, more than 140 to 150 cases of keratoconus now. We published our first results of the 24 cases in JRS. Here's a patient where you can see a lot of improvement in topography, as you can see here, an uncorrected from 624 part to 69 part. Here's another patient with an improvement in topography and a decrease in the sphere and cylinder and improvement in uncorrected visual acuity as well. Now, I am not sure whether you, yeah, you should be able to see these. So, this is a post-op map. This is a pre-operative map. And you can see the amount of flattening that this, these scare segments have produced at the slit lamp examination. And uh, the vision improved from 2060 part to 2030 uncorrected and refraction dropped from minus 5.5 four cylinder to minus one with three cylinder 2020 part. Here's another example where you can see again pre-op in the middle, post-op to the left-hand side and the difference map on the right-hand side showing how the cylinder has been decreased quite a bit uh, following this implantation of, of, uh, of uh, these segments. And you can see that the cylinders, uh, he needed a five diopter cylinder to improve to 6.9, and then he came to an uncorrected 6.9 postoperatively. Here's an asymmetric segment. And you can see preoperatively a lot of steepening here, postoperatively uh, flattening and a difference map also showing a lot of flattening. Again, a asymmetric segment with just an inferior uh, segment placed, and you can see even up to a 14 diopter flattening in the difference map, pre-op, post-op, and a great deal of regularization of the topography. Uh, here are some other examples, and let me see if I can just zoom this up a bit so that you can see it. All right. Okay, one second. Okay, here's a patient who had cross-linking. Uh, this was uh, a patient who uh, underwent a CARES with a cross-linking in the right eye and a plain cross-linking uh, in the left eye. No, no, I'm sorry. That's the next case I'm going to show you. This case was a patient who had high cylinders in the right eye, underwent cross-linking, and you can see how this cornea is flattened out. And this is something that, again, Shady Award had explained to me how you get a sea of flattening followed by a little bit of steepening in the opposite direction, which gives you a de good decrease in the cylinder. So you can see this patient's cylinder dropped from about 10 diopters to five diopters, and the uncorrected improved from 21, 20 to 20, 30. And this patient was so happy with the right eye that she opted to undergo cares in the left eye as well. And you can see that the left eye, the refractive error was really small. It was only uh, pre-operatively minus one with a minus 1.25 diopter cylinder, six, six. And uh, she still wanted CARES to try and improve the quality of vision, which we did. And she improved to minus 0.5 with minus 0.566 and almost an uncorrected of uh, 2020. So that's, that's the CARES that you see in the left eye and in the right eye. And you can see how just by decreasing the thickness of the segment that was implanted, we were able to get a differential effect with a lot of flattening and, uh, in, the, in the right eye and a minimal amount of flattening and improvement in regularization and topography in the left eye. Here's a patient who uh, underwent CARES with cross-linking in the right eye and only cross-linking in the left eye. And just the difference map alone shows you the effect that was obtained in the right eye slit lamp you've seen here. Whereas in the left eye, you can see that the cross-linking really did not produce much effect on the topography. She uh, was not very happy with her. She didn't undergo the first sitting cares because she, was not, uh, she did not have the money for it, but she did not like the vision in the left eye, the pure cross-linked eye. So she came back a year later to undergo cross-linking in in to undergo cares in the right, left eye as well. This was pre-op. As you see, not much difference are just post cross-linking alone. And this is post the CARES implantation. And you can see again, a lot of flattening 
uh, post cares and uh, and regularization of the topography she improved from 2200 to 2060 here's another patient again you can see uh, this was a patient who underwent cares with cross linking in the right eye plain cross linking in the left eye he had a power of minus 10 with minus 3 preoperatively in the right eye dropped to minus 5 with minus 2 postoperatively in the right eye and in the left eye we did just a cross linking alone partly because of financial reasons but also we were very happy with the result that we got because his his anazikonia improved and he's just he had almost similar powers in both the eyes uh, despite not having implanted cares in one eye because with the cross linked alone eye we really did not get much effect and the cross the cares with cross linked eye we got a drop in the refraction which came to approximately the same as the left eye Here's a patient who had 72 diopters and we got it down to about 59 diopters. This was a patient who I might have otherwise gone for a DALC, but we avoided DALC in this patient. And now I'm happy to say the large number of patients where we would have otherwise done a DALC just because of the immense steepening, uh, which these patients have. I've done up to 82, 83, 84 diopters of steepening corneas. What the CARES does is it gets the cornea down to flatter levels. And then we continue with cross-linking and we are able to salvage these patients or not avoid these patients from undergoing a DALC. And we know that any day, uh, if you can do something other than a corneal transplantation that has better effects, we get a huge improvement in the visual acuity also with these patients. Here you can see almost a 20 diopter flattening post-operatively and, and a lot of regularization of the cornea. And surprisingly, this of course doesn't happen every patient here. The post-operative astigmatism was just 0.3 diopters. So again, other examples. Here is a video which shows that it's also adjustable. This was a patient we uh, implanted the care segment in. We went down and uh, we were not sure about its location. So we checked the visual acuity in the topography and we thought that it needed a little bit of uh, shifting. So the next day we took the patient up again. And you can see that we just kind of moved it a bit with some pressure with, the, with actually focal pressure with that bend or the hinge of that uh, or the bend of that uh, of that rod of that instrument. And with some pressure with that bend, we were able to slide it forwards and get it into a position which was more desired. Of course, if you have two cuts, two incisions on either side, you could just put in a reverse Sinsky and also pull it into position. So it's also something that is adjustable. So it's something that gives you a lot of leeway for uh, for whatever you want to do. It is similar to do for those who uh, handle corneas and even refractive surgeons. We know that LASIK flaps can be lifted up uh, after long. Uh, we know that DAL can be repeated. And every time you do these things, you do need to apply a little bit of force at the edges, at the periphery where there's scarring. But otherwise, you can do it. Fail these are graphs. You know that you can remove them. It's a similar way. Uh, you would be able to remove cares also after some time if you did want to for any reason, whatever. Here are full FDOCT images of the segments. These are light microscopic images of the segment showing very uniformly arranged collagen fibers. This was a peer-reviewed journal in uh, JRS which showed significant improvement in all the, all the visual parameters, uncorrected and best corrected, spherical equivalent, topographic astigmatism, maximum K, steepest K, anti and posterior best fit spheres, mean powers, and almost everything else. This has been featured in a lot of places now, and uh, also it is reimbursable. In India also, we are able to cover it under insurance. Uh, it is reimbursable, and, and it would be reimbursable in US as a lamellar graft or as an ICRS, and best part is being a tissue transplant, FDA approval is not needed. So what it does is improves quality and quantity of vision. It decreases, helps in decreasing progression the same way that any intrastromal corneal ring segment does by redistributing the uh, stress forces over the entire cornea rather than only at the cone. Uh, it can be used in all the cases from mild to advanced, and it can help even prevent a corneal transplantation in many extreme cases. Uh, in many countries, it's also more economical. For example, for us in India, it would be more economical. Of course, it would depend from country to country depending on eye banking tissue costs. So to conclude, it's, this is uh, basically allogenic tissue that I use. Uh, it has no disadvantages of synthetic segments. It's biocompatible with good corneal integration and less complications, uh, such as new vascularization, stromal melts, and so on and so forth. It's easily available in, in, uh, some of, in most countries. It's easy to perform with a pull-through or a push-in technique. It's effective, stable, simple, safe, reversible, adjustable. And another question that I'm often asked is, would it undergo rejection? Well, the answer to that is there's a very low volume of stromal tissue that's being transferred. There's no epithelium or endothelial transfer at all, which are the most antigenic layers of the cornea. We know that. Uh, you get very rapid keratocyte repopulation from the surrounding host trauma because it's absolutely ensconced within the 
stroma from all sides you get the keratocyte population of that small little bit of tissue happening really rapidly we know that even in dalk where you transfer so much more of volume of tissue in comparison the incidence of rejection is really low so here it is really really low it's a more of a place far from the limbus and the limbal blood vessels it's uh, there are no sutures to incite vascularization so for all these reasons the chances of rejection is very low we use steroids only for one and a half months at the same post cataract uh, regimen that i use no high high amount of steroid and even in the worst case scenario it's outside the visual axis so it really does not matter thank you so much thank you Hello. very much and um, we will have one more presentation given by uh, renato and then we can all enter the discussion i see that we still have uh, 469 with us that's quite a bit for a friday evening and, uh, thank you thank you it's excellent. For, 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 for not only 470 here, we have more than 200 uh, live in YouTube as well. Oh, fantastic. Great. I think when we started out, we were at more than 1,000. We had about 1,016, yeah. Yeah. Which, is, which is really tremendous. That is I, don't think, I don't think you would have that many number in any room that you attend any conference for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure not. You have to even, even to in the scenario. Yeah. And it's also very difficult to get uh, such a very uh, important group of speakers at the same time together. So we have to thank you for that, Jose. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Okay, Farhad, continue with Renato, please. Yes, Renato, please go on. Thank you, Farhad. So I, I really believe it's a great thing that you take the opportunity to to, to discuss a case. So this is a patient with 70, 17 years old, came with a bad vision in the left eye. The parents were very concerned that it was basically from the third or the fourth opinion that they came. Dr. For, yes. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Please. Mute one of your uh, accounts because you you're logged in through two of them and they're both. Uh... Yeah, we have an echo. Yes, I was. Is better now? Yes, yes. now it's perfect. There is no echo. Perfect. So it was a, a a patient that came with a third or fourth opinion. So the patient is 2020 uncorrected in the right eye, and the patient is 2100 in the left eye, and basically everything is normal. With it's little lamp and fundus normal pressure, manifest refraction, you can get down to 2015 in the right eye, and the right eye, uh, the left eye doesn't correct to better than 2030 with astigmatism. So I leave this case for some, some discussion, what people would do for the right eye, for the left eye. Uh, you know, this, this parents were very concerned, and then I will later tell uh, what was my, my, uh, my management for this case. So far, how do you want to uh, organize the discussion? Maybe starting with Susan or you. Um, yes, with pleasure. Thank you, Renato. I, I suggest, uh, um, Susan, would you, would you give your opinion to it? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Loudly. Yes, I, uh, I, since he's got bad vision and he's obviously got a decentered cone here, I would possibly go in for a CARES, maybe a, a single a segment, uh, probably a tangential map would help me, uh, you know, figure that out better and a little more information on, yeah, his refraction is given right here, 0.75 and 3.5. So that, that may be something I would do. Uh, and then he's 17 years, so I possibly uh, would also combine it with cross-linking. In the right eye, I can't see the figure much, but obviously he's got uh, a lot of asymmetry with inferior steepening. So it would depend on his refraction, minus one with 24. All right, so probably uh, just a plain cross-linking alone may be enough also for this right eye. So would, would you do- I think Renato, but you're, going to, you're going to come up with some surprising something. No, no, actually, no, actually not. It's not surprising, I think. Uh, would you do cross-linking, epi off cross-linking in the right eye? Well, uh, I would do the left eye first, and then I would. Uh, it would take uh, some time 
for him to heal i would probably have one to two months gap to wise so i would do a follow up uh, topography again at that second point of time and then decide but hello everybody can i can i interfere can i please please yeah uh, for me uh, a 17 year old boy is still in the pediatric that in you hear me yes we hear you yeah, for, for me, a 17-year-old young man or boy is still in the pediatric age group. And in those cases, the, 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 uh, he will have, for sure, an advancement with age. So I don't hesitate to do an epi of corneal cross-linking immediately when I see such patients and bilaterally. Um, surprisingly enough, even in the worst eye, which is the left eye, there will be a kind of regularization of the cornea that will improve tremendously the uncorrected visual acti to be uh, 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 fit for glasses or even for further intervention later on in the form of uh, toric ICL. Uh, in those cases, I, I refrain very much from implanting an intracorneal ring segments because they are still young and I'm not sure about the behavior of a PMMA material inside his cornea after 10 or 20 years, because we don't have clue if they are going to live indefinitely with it or not. But first of all, with, with the, my aim will be to stabilize this cornea. And the, in such cases, the cornea is too malleable. If you do a perfect corneal cross-linking epi off, of course, you will have an improvement of the uncorrected visual acti. You will have a stable sphere and cylinder that will allow you for further rehabilitation, even just with glasses. Okay. Um, Farad, can I can I also um, please? Yes, okay. please. So, um, uh, I mean, uh, Shavi, you have a, a, a few a few points here, but what I would do still, this is a cone that uh, responds beautifully to cornea ring segments. It's an additive procedure. We know they work, we know they're stable, whether you're doing CARES and, and you have a lot of experience like Susan, so, or you just wanna do a PMMA, I think they do work. If the patient does not have blepharitis, I would go ahead either with uh, corneal ring segment if you're familiar with, with the technology or with CARES, and I would improve the asymmetrism, and then I would cross-link, but not on the same session. I like to cross-link at least two weeks later to make sure that the patient improves uh, make sure that I'm not going to remove the ring or change the orientation. And, and we know that the effect of the ring segments, whether KS or ICRS, happen in within two weeks. And then I will proceed with cross-linking. Uh, that's what I would do because it's not, uh, it's not even guaranteed that we're going to improve in more than 20, 30. But again, I mean, I would ask the patient if he's very happy, he doesn't mind uh, wearing the spectacles, then uh, the minimum would be cross-linking. But if the patient is receptive to improve his visual quality, then I would go ahead with cornea rings. So for me, cornea rings is not essential, but it's something additive. It's safe enough to proceed for it and then cross-linking within two weeks. Thank you very much, Shadi. Um, Dan, would, would you like to comment? I, 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 I was gonna, I was assuming um, what Susan was saying, which was that uh, I can't see the case anymore. It's just the, it's just uh, our faces. Have you, have you taken away your- Which the cases? Uh, okay, so um, I have actually seen cases where basement membrane dystrophy has caused this kind of topography. And so I would just say, I wanna see an epithelial thickness map before I start putting rings in the eye. Although I think no. it's highly unlikely because of the no. case. Are you yeah. muted or can you answer? I, I, am I on mute? Can you hear me? Well, yes. uh, we can hear you then. I was just wondering whether Renato can speak uh, no. regarding epithelial thickness. No, um, I don't have the epithelial thickness on the slides, but it was uh, actually this patient is from 2010. At that time, I did not have the epithelial thickness, but uh, I can tell you that he is a true keratoconus, for sure he is a true keratoconus. Well, let me just say that I have seen patients who were told that they had post-LASIK ectasia. And well, I when I mapped their epithelium, I was able to be very convinced that they did not have ectasia. So, you know, I think epithelial mapping, which of course 
only became, if you want, I can show you a slide that shows the history of epithelial mapping because I, I, I talk about that. But, you know, I measured it in 1991 for the first time in 3D. No one had ever done that before. It had been measured in individual locations with, a, with an optical pachymeter. Um, and so by my, like no one was really able to do epithelial maps until it became commercially available. Some prototypes came out from OptoView in 2012 um, and it was commercially available 2015. So, you know, my practice has, I've always had access to this ever since. I, I, I had it before I was a resident in ophthalmology and during my residency. So I've never lived without epithelial maps. So it's so for me, it's it's almost like I, I I I rarely will give an opinion unless I have an epithelial map because I've seen where the epithelial map can change our opinion. Um, the MS thirty nine, uh, I have to say, is in my view there one can actually if one wants to practice at the highest possible standard of diagnostics. If you ha I'm talking about corneal mapping and biometry. If you have an MS-39 and an Insight 100, if you have those two devices, you basically have everything on the planet in terms of anatomical um, diagnostics. Because those two devices give you accurate front surface curvature, accurate back surface curvature. Uh, the ultrasound, of course, has, has different properties than optical devices for imaging, so it gives you information that you can't get with optical devices, and vice versa. And so between those two machines, you, you really feel super equipped to approach any diagnosis um, whatsoever. That's the only thing I would add, because I'm not going to add anything to what I would do here um, from what's already been said from uh, world experts. Um, thank right. you very much, Dan. And I will also give my two cents, two questions to Renato. Um, how fast was the was the worsening, and is he an eye rubber? Yes, he's an eye rubber. Excellent question. Actually, that was the question. And the the patient is seventeen years old. He had had a. I remember he had an ophthalmology examination when he was fifteen years old. Everything was pretty much normal. He did not need glasses. And he noticed the vision to get worse over the last six months. And suddenly he, from one day to the other, he realized his left eye was not seeing at all. I see. So what, what I would do um, now in, in, in March, 2020, um, on the left eye, because as Mohammed said, he's in the pediatric population. And there was, there's not only our study from 2012, there's also now an Australian study on almost 600 eyes showing natural progression in children and adolescents with a, with a progression rate of almost 80%, even if you stop rubbing. So I would cross-link both eyes. The left eye, as per today, um, I would do an epi off, but not based on 5.4 joule. We are currently going up to 10 joule um, in, in, uh, when the thickness is over 400. And we will, I think, publish on this in, 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 in a few months. So in, in, an, age, uh, in an age group where the, where the cone is so aggressive, we do far more than the current Dresden protocol um, with, a uniform, with a uniform approach, not in a customized approach. The, the right eye, I would probably either watch very closely because I see the patient anyway on, for the post-op follow-ups of the left eye and I would immediately cross-link him or I would, if the patient is going for it and I can control the haze, the patient is uh, compliant and comes into other follow-ups, I would cross-link the right eye right away, epi off. If you would ask me the same question in one year, I hope I could tell you that I would do Cosimo Mazotta's approach, which means the 18 milliwatts pulse light, high fluent, 7.2 joule in an epi on iontophoresis assisted manner without additional oxygen. And this is something I'm very excited because Cosimo, I think, is um, has combined all the different elements we might need to do successful epi on cross-linking without additional oxygen, uh, just with the, uh, with the oxygen in the atmosphere. So maybe the answer will be in a year or two, cross-link this teenager um, in an epi on manner safely and with a lot of efficacy. 
uh, Farhad, uh, you mean that you deliver almost double the radiance for those aggressive keratoconus in the left yes. eye? Double the radiance. Yes. Oh, this, yes, is, this, this is, is not interesting, actually. This is not yet published, but we go to 7.2. We even go to 10 joule per square centimeter over the um, in, in AP of procedures. I'm aware that we are live and on Facebook. Please, this is this is not uh, an established protocol. I'm just saying that we know now that the the endothelial threshold level for for um, for the endothelium is way higher than 5.4. So we can go higher. And I think we will we will have more adapted uh, protocols for aggressive forms in the future that go way beyond the Dresden protocol. But we also are probably uh, being listened to by, by patients, and and the patients should know that the current the current gold standard still remains EPOF and Dresden protocol and maybe 7.2. But uh, again, uh, our field is very dynamic, and we will get to different fluence levels. Interesting. Well, uh, let me ask you, Farhad, uh, with the 10, 10 fluence, uh, are you, what energy level and how long does it take? It, you stay there for an hour with the three milliwatts? We, we go to highly accelerated protocols, um, knowing that uh, acceleration reduces efficacy. But if you compensate with higher fluence and AP off, you are still way more efficient than with the Dresden protocol. So. Okay. Um, at the same time, we are trying to look at this in the lab to understand uh, in stress strain measurements, how far can we go? But I think the recent publications from the Xyla group have shown that you can go, uh, go way up with the fluence without harming the endothelium. And customized cross-linking already now is using up to 15 joule in the sensor. Um, so we, we have a lot of uh, possibilities, I think, in the near future to, to pump up the, the fluence without harming the endothelium. Well, I mean, the only thing I'd say is that is that custom cross-linking um, has not shown to be really doing what it was supposed to do, um, and, and and I would question, I would just put a little question mark on high fluence cross-linking because um, my understanding is that once the riboflavin is depleted you're not going to be creating the radicals required to create the cross-linking. And so unless, you know, you, you've got oxygen, you've got your, whatever radical you're going to use, in, in this case, it's vitamin B. And just, you know, if you deplete it all at once, then you can shine the light on as long as, long as you like, and it won't, it won't be doing any, anything to the cornea. I think what, what was working with the, with the Dresden protocol was that, the, if I, I mean, I'm trying to think back 15 years when I started cross-linking according to that work, I don't remember where I read this, but I was continuing to supplement drops of riboflavin every two minutes. And so what I think- saying, What you shouldn't do now anymore then because- I know, that you're, I know that people are saying that. I know that people are saying that and that it blocks the UV and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But you know- Blah, blah, blah comes from Eberhard Sperl himself, who, who has recently shown that. But I didn't mention the customized cross-linking because I want to customize cross-link this boy. I simply mentioned it because it shows us that a human cornea can take up to 15 joules without showing endothelial damage. Okay, and okay. Safety-wise, but efficacy-wise. Yeah, but, but what I mentioned with the up to 10 joule is uniform irradiation, is not customized. Right, right. Yeah. So we should just put these two into the different areas they belong to. But I, but I think, uh, let's see what customized brings in the future. Also, uh, the groups doing customized cross-linking use, use a higher concentration of riboflavin. So there is more chromophore available per photon. Well, this, so I think we can this play is with all mishmash that is not solved. I mean, we haven't solved. The, the fact is, if you load a cornea with a higher concentration of riboflavin in the first place, you might then be able to cross-link faster because you've got more radical to be formed. But if we, it, it, the, the combination of all these factors of the riboflavin con concentration in the cornea, the oxygen depletion and the power and those three factors, I don't think, I think we're, we're still a bit, there's just so many different protocols at the moment in the world that I don't think we have an optimal answer. And I mean, you've done a lot of work. 
I have David O'Brien here in the UK has done a lot of work. Everyone's coming at this and I'm confused because I'm not doing research in this area. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to find out what to do. And I'm everywhere I turn, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I wonder if the audience of, of 411 people uh, feel similar to the way I feel. I, I think uh, after all these years now, slowly the pieces of the puzzle come together and we start understanding how we can manipulate these single factors to into and orchestrate them in a way to, to use this to our great advantage. So I think in the next 24 months, we will have a lot of answers to the, all the questions you raised and you, you raised exactly the questions we need to answer. Yeah. And then I, I have to do a private video chat with you to better understand uh, the epithelium because I have a few open questions there. Well, I, I actually I have two very good questions in the in the um, in the in, in the, chem, the webinar system here, and and actually I managed to put together um, uh, some answers on slides, and I, I and I wonder whether um, if I share my screen, can I do that uh, again? Is that is that allowed? Jose, uh, yeah. What, what, well, Jose, would this be the time where we, uh, where everybody from the panel would answer one or two questions from the from the audience? Because they're to do with behavior of the epithelium in the way that you you. I, and I wonder whether these are your questions. For example, just um, I'm sorry, Dan. Just very briefly, uh, Jose Vargas, is it Jose? Is it okay to start with uh, questions from the audience? And yes, then would, uh, then we can. First? I don't know if Renato finished already. Because this was many years ago. Uh, do you have the final evaluation of the patient, Renato? I can share very quickly. Uh, I just want to share what, what this patient had. And actually, this patient was uh, very instructive for us in many times. So there was no surgery in the right eye. We treat the allergy. We tell, told the patient not to rub the eye. Actually, one of the colleagues told the patient to do a transplant in the left eye because the patient also failed the contact lens trial and do cross-linking in the right eye. So the transplant is a good option, but is the least option. Used to be the only option, but now we have many options available for attempting improving vision and halting the, the progression without invasive, so invasive procedures. So what we did, it was a Brazilian cornea ring the, it was a Medifacos Keta ring uh, implanted in the, in the left eye. And this is the picture of the patient in 2018 with the shine flute. Uh, I have the epithelial thickness, but for the sake of the time, I did not put in this presentation. The patient is still stable with 2020 uncorrect vision and 2030 uncorrect vision, the left eye, correctable to 2020 minus one. And his last follow-up was to February to 2019. He was actually scheduled for the next, the last week, but we canceled because of the COVID-19 pandemic situation. And I hope to see him very soon. And we have some documentation on the on the right eye, on the ABCD. And you know, I know that we want to cross-link the patient to avoid vision loss. But if you remember Kohler and Seiler publication, I think Michael Morohan was part of this publication in the JCRS about 12 years ago. The failure and complication rate will be related to the distance correct vision before surgery. This patient's 2015 distance correct vision, 2020 uncorrect vision, the right eye. So just observation will be the best for this patient. Uh, this, this patient was actually published in your book, Farhad, and I was honored to be one of your collaborators for this book, also in the International Journal of Curative Conus. Today, what I would do differently, I, would, I don't know if it's gonna be effective or not, but besides treating allergy, telling the patient not to rub the eye, I will put him in a riboflavin rich diet, eventually with supplements. And telling the patient not to rub the eye is one of the most important messages. This is, by the way, one of the 100% consensus that we achieved. In, in the 2015 consensus. We know that managing keratoplasty, we have paradigms broken with cross-linking, but the paradox is when we need to do it, it should be done as soon as possible. But when we don't need to do it, probably 
waiting until we need is important. We have to understand that refractive surgery is not laser vision correction. They share a lot of in common, but as the DNA of a cat and a lion, they share a lot in common too. And if you want to pet a lion like you pet a cat, you're probably in big trouble. So we have to understand there are different situations, refractive surgery, the collagen cross-linking, and eventually I have one other situation to share. This is a patient that I saw in 2017. And this patient was at 71. It was a Down syndrome. I, I remember talking to, to you about the, the 21 light. And this was a patient I was going to treat for free, but they decided not to do the surgery because of the, he would need a, a, a general anesthesia. And the patients came back in 19 and the huge increase from 71 to 100, from 51 to 75, but he's still functioning. And even here, they still, the parents they still don't want to, to do surgery in the patient. So, and you see the huge improvement in the, the not improvement, but the huge progression in the, yeah. in the case. This is a very quick 50 patients that we did surgery only in one eye. Uh, this was presented in the SRS by Diogo Lopez very quickly, just to show you that the fellow eye of patients that we did surgery only in one eye, they, uh, of course, the operated eye did improve, uncorrect, discorrect vision and ABCD, they did improve, but the non-operated eye also improved distance correct vision with no surgery. We are talking about patients that did not, sur not have any surgery, and I um, I think Juan Abad from Colombia is listening to this presentation. He just had uh, put together a very nice series with exactly the same finding. So cross-linking is a great procedure. We, I'm not saying not to do it, but I think we have to avoid, uh, unless we have a true efficacious epion cross-linking, be very careful when we do patients with 2025 or better because of the risk for that. So. Surgery in all cases is not what we should do. Patient education is always a must. The message of eye rubbing should be promoted, not sleeping over the eye as well. We have to understand the evidence of multimodal imaging because eventually we have a prognostic factor because the prognostic factor may be helping us to say the patients may need, uh, may have a higher risk for progression. So the prognostic factor with biomechanical analysis and please, Consider all of you guys, you are the, the leaders, you are the opinion leaders that we have on Keratoconus, hashtag Violet June 4 kc And I do believe next June will be a very special month for all of us because that will be probably when we get over this pandemic. And the violet is a very special light. Please consider Violet June 4 kc and read about the importance of violet for all of us in humanity. Thank you very much. And I leave the, the, the questions and let's go for the answering the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Renato. That was a, a very nice uh, finishing of, uh, of our sessions and quite moving. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, Jose, would you like to take over for the questions and answers? No, no, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. Do fantastic. Give me a little break. Go ahead. So I think all let's of just us do one question. For, uh, yeah. Let's do only one question okay. uh, because I know we have uh, a lot of questions. So let's do one question for each one to answer verbally. Um, I start let's on the right with, of uh, Okay. Um, I would start with Susan, then Mohammed, then Shadi, then Dan, then Renato, then myself. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Susan, right. would you like to pick your question? Yeah, sure. So, um, I think the question that I'm going to take is uh, a question that says, "What do you when do you specialists, keratoconus colleagues choose to use cross-linking or ring segments on general population and in children? Uh, and also, uh, I'll combine it with a second question, which said that uh, basically that are these thin corneas, should they, are they really worth cross-linking? So uh, this, uh, my, my thoughts on these are very simple. Uh, if you can do a cross-linking safely, you should definitely cross-link there uh, provided it depends of, of course on the age group in pediatric in certain populations pediatric populations down syndrome people who are very likely to progress and uh, where the where the follow-up is not likely to be as smooth 
uh, you definitely should cross-link at uh, as soon as there is evidence of keratoconus because these are the patients who are likely to progress very rapidly and any loss of time is loss of uh, tissue and loss and, and an increase in the keratoconus. So for these patients, definitely cross-link. In many of these patients, I combine it with CARES. Mm, I used to do ICRS, uh, but I've stopped it for the last, I think, four years or maybe slightly more. Ever since I started doing CARES, we have stopped ICRS, synthetic ICRS completely in our hospital. And many of these patients, I've done a large number of CARES in pediatric population as well. I think a, a large number in the sense about, I think I've got about five cases now, uh, who are also doing very well, the youngest age being about nine years. And uh, we, uh, we were surprised to see, at least in India, that the children do cooperate well for the femtosecond laser, for the femtosecond laser channel, as long as you explain it to them properly kind of, you know, uh, walk them through it, tell them, look, it's just going to be a slight pressure on your eye. You just touch their shoulder and say, look, this is the amount of pressure. And there's a test that I do in the outpatient department to see if the child is going to be cooperative. It's very simple. Do not put anesthetic drops into the eye, patient's eye. Just go and touch the patient's eye. I'm not sure if my video is being seen. Uh, my face is being seen on the screen, but this is, if, if it is, yes, this is what I do. I just go and, okay, in this COVID season, I'm not supposed to be doing that. But but basically what you do is just touch the sclera, the conjunctiva of the child's eye and see his behavior. If he's kind of, you know, moving back and kind of scared, uh, then he may not be a good candidate for topical intral uh, femtosecond laser channel. But there are a lot of children who just let you do that, just let you touch the conjunctiva and they don't draw back. And those children are really, this is a beautiful test that you can do in outpatient to see if these are going to be cooperative children. And we've done about five or six cases now. And, and, and also Down syndrome we've done. And it's really nice to be able to avoid a DALC in these advanced cases of Down syndrome because they are the patients who you do not get perfect follow-up with. You'll have suture-related problems. You'll have so many other problems with DALC, uh, which, which is very difficult to manage in them. And a CARES with the cross-linking really does help to solve these patients. Uh, I've done severe cerebral palsies. So a lot of patients uh, where you can avoid a DALC, you can do a CARES with cross-linking. And I really think it is worth doing a cross-linking even in thin corneas because because you always have the DALC to fall back on. But once you do the DALC, you cannot do a, do a less uh, invasive procedure. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, the next person would be Mohammed. Mohammed, could you, have you picked a question? Yeah, I, I got a lot of questions, but I'll choose the one that says, when do you choose to implant a toric ICL? And when do you choose to do a sort of customized PRK? And I think both, both work uh, as a visual rehabilitation, but uh, and we are very good both of the techniques. But after one year of corneal cross-linking, and I believe in the power of corneal cross-linking to modify the cornea to a more regular irregularity, that's to say to a more stable uh, regularity or irregularity that we can measure. And from here, we kick off to, to decide which plan are we going to do to rehabilitate the cornea. So if the patient has enough thickness of the cornea and a little uh, sphere and cylinder to allow for us uh, a safe PRK, according to my guidelines, to leave the cornea at least 400 microns afterwards and not to move or to remove more than 15% of the central cornea thickness, I think it's wise to do a kind of customized PRK with micromycin C to regularize the cornea, even if we don't reach the full emetropia and the patient will depend later on on a kind of very thin glasses to complete the issue. But if the case is a high sphere and cylinder, and the patient uh, is improving with his best corrected visual acuity, the spectacle one, to 0.3 or more, which is 618, uh, I think I will give to him glasses for uh, a month or a couple of months. And if he's uh, very comfortable with these glasses, I will go and implant for him a sort of thick IOLs and insist such occasion a toric ICL is, is a very good choice based on the subjective refraction and not on the objective refraction to uh, emphasize the, the value of the shifting of the line of sight that Dr. Awad uh, uh, mentioned in his uh, nice talk. Because uh, the shifting of line of sight makes the patient see is uh, totally different from the line that we refract on. So you have to exhaust all your measures before giving the patient the uh, 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 prescription for the toric ICL, before you prescribe the toric ICL for the company and exhaust all your measures to prove the subjective refraction uh, of the sphere, cylinder, and axis, the lowest one that corrects the, the patient best 
before uh, 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 prescribing or ordering your historic ICR. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. Um, just just a personal note. Now, now looking at you, we've been spending three hours together. I, I must say that it's it's a, a little unreal to me. All of the panelists, we are so used traveling extensively and teaching all over. And I'm so used to seeing all of you every few weeks somewhere on this planet. You have become like an extended family. So I really miss seeing you. So it's, it's nice to at least see you virtually. So the next one would be um, would be Shadi. No, but can I, I add something really related to the topic that you're talking about? The number of the audience that we're still having on the YouTube and here is really surprising. I mean, we, we, we travel all over the world and the maximum audience that you can get in the best meeting is 300 or 400. But this way, we are allowed to be listened by at least 1,000. This is really amazing. And uh, it can change completely our, our view of the way that we are teaching to, to, to others or learning even from others. I think we all agree it will change the only future. That's only if you're lucky to get Holly, the 300 of <laughs> this is It is amazing to be able to have uh, more than 1,000 at, at the beginning. And after the first two hours, we still were with more than 1,000 people. Uh, I hope that once uh, this pandemic is over, we will be able to get together and continue doing this. I've been doing this for a year. Uh, this is, I think, the second or the third time that we get a big panel of people. Uh, and it's a little bit difficult to get everybody together and it's a little bit difficult to coordinate everything. But we did, and we have a lot of people happen sending a lot of good message. And this is all because of you guys. Please, once this is over, we need to still get in together and do this because a lot of people benefit from this. A lot of people doesn't have the chance to go to meetings. A lot of people doesn't even have the possibility to do many trips. So please, uh, we need your cooperation and hopefully we can get together all the time and do this kind of meetings. Sounds great. Absolutely. Okay, let's go for the next one. Hey, also, also, also we, get to, we get to see Renata doing all that cool stuff on a screen. <laughs> <laughs> guys, guys, we, we have a surprise. <laughs> have our hat. Yeah. We have a surprise. Uh, the message for the people, uh, the panelists, um, message for the people that are still on watching us, do not go away. Couple more questions and we have a surprise for everybody. So couple more questions and we have a surprise. Oh, fantastic. Okay, <laughs> we will stick there. Uh, the next one is uh, Shadi, then then Dan, uh, then myself. There, there's, there's nothing specific for me, so I'll pass, leave more time for you guys. <laughs> okay, so it's I think it's Dan now. Yeah. Can you hear us, Dan? You may skip, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Dan is getting prepared for the surprise. <laughs> yeah, so the, you're the last one for him. I'm ready for the surprise. I, I'm always ready for those surprises. Okay, so I'm gonna. Uh, uh, so I picked. Um, I picked my questions for me, and actually, they're both answered uh, in, a, in a similar way. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Good. So the questions I had were. Um, uh, are there any false negatives using epithelial mapping? I have a case of bilateral keratoconus with tomographic and topographic criteria, but epithelial mapping is showing thickening of the apex in both eyes, which is uncommon. Of course, and I asked you to screen capture that slide of the different scenarios. And you know, you always gotta keep it simple when you're doing the basics, but I'm gonna show you, uh, I'm gonna give you an answer to this question. And the second question, which is correlated, um, would I consider wet PRK as a substitute for wavefront guided PRK for irregular corneas in certain cases? Okay, so I'm gonna answer both questions. So essentially, this is a very nice paper which um, went through a, an extensive review process. Um, I have to say, I, I, uh, you know you know when you're, you, um, so, so Carolina, Rocha, she, she, this was, you know, she did a huge amount of work on the OCT with the prototype in 2012 or so. And the, she knew, she knew that I was the reviewer and, and I couldn't hide it, right? Because who else is going to review this? 
but she was asking exactly the same question. I have this keratoconus case and the cone, is, the cone is huge and the epithelium is thicker. So the Reinstein hypothesis is wrong. Okay, all right, so let me just show you how this is level two, because we only talk about level one. There are four rules to how the epithelium behaves, okay? Mm -hmm. And I've put a link here. Oh, shit. Keeps on. Okay, I put a link here, which I want you to, to look at. It's tinyurl.com, okay? So, so S O U Z 15 W, okay? And just see if you can, um, you know. Uh, go to that link and you'll you'll get a long version of this, what I'm going to show you, which are the four rules. The epithelium always thickens to fill depressions. So ectasia, if there's a depression outside of the cone, you will get a donut of filling. Same with hyperopic LASIK. Same with radial keratotomy. There's going to be a depression in the center, so the epithelium gets thicker. You didn't remove any tissue. You just flattened the center with some mid-peripheral incisions. Orthokeratology will redistribute the epithelium. So that's rule number one. Rule number two, the epithelium will always thin over stromal peaks. So like I showed you, the more severe the keratoconus in this axis of behavior, because it's, 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 a, it's a biphasic axis, the epithelium will become thinner. The epithelium is thin over a cone of ectasia. The epithelium becomes thinner in the center of a hyperopic cornea, LASIK cornea, and thicker in the periphery where it's filling the, the depression. Number three, Thank you very much. the epithelium, the epithelial change is proportional to the stromal change. So we've got papers all over the place even from, from early 90s, where we showed that the more you treat PRK, the more the epithelium will thicken. Obviously, the more the keratoconus you treat, the more hyperopia you treat, the thinnest point gets thinner, the thicker point gets thinner, thicker. It's proportional to the stromal change. And rule number four, it's defined also by the rate of change of curvature. So if you have a little corneal ulcer, which I have one here, which is a Two, a one millimeter wide, 200 micron deep corneal ulcer loss of tissue, you're going to get practically full compensation by the epithelium because the rate of change of curvature is very severe. When we were doing PRK in the early 90s in four millimeter zones, um, you, you had massive epithelial compensation because the rate of change of curvature was severe and there was the people called it regression, but it wasn't regression. It was wound healing to the target where the epithelium equilibrates based on the rate of change of curvature. And when David O'Brien did the studies with John Marshall expanding the optical zones, they found less overshoot at the beginning and less trajectory to get to the target refraction. So less compensation by the epithelium. So if you keep these four rules in mind, you can quite understand, it's, it's quite easy now to understand why this cornea, which has severe tissue loss due to an apical scar and contraction and whatever, you can see why the epithelium is thicker, even though the curvature is steeper. It's because the, the curvature of the stromal surface flattens and then steepens. So over the area that it's flatter, the rate of change of curvature is, is lower, you're going to get epithelial compensation. And I said this earlier in my talk, the template for the outer growth of the epithelium is the tarsus, it's the eyelid. And so um, actually in my, in my talk, I showed you, uh, no, I didn't have that slide, but okay. So, so you see you're, 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 you're losing stromal tissue on, on the one hand, and then you've got the, the template here, which is not going to, the, of the eyelid, which is not going to bend in, it stays where it is. And so that gap is going to be filled by epithelium. So understanding this behavior is what allows you to understand why you can 
have false negatives when you're looking at epithelial thickness profiles. And to answer the question as to whether I would do uh, PTK, well, the answer to that is um, not in that case, uh, not a wet PTK, because wet PTK is for essentially microfolds, super high frequency noise that it, you can't see on a topographer. And the surface tension of water is such that if you ablate a fully um, soaked and surface tension covered corneal surface, if you ablate that, the peaks of these microfolds, when the shock wave of the eczema hits the water, you will get a parting of the Red Sea, like a parting of the water for an instant, and the next pulse will hit the stromal surface. And so wet PTK is for, uh, you've done a, P, let's say you've uh, removed the epithelium from an enhancement, that you, from an old LASIK. There's a lot of microfolds, you, and you, you do a little enhancement, but you, the microfolds look terrible. You will flood the cornea with water, and you'll ablate the water, usually about eight seconds or so before it breaks, and then you stop, fill the water again, and ablate again. And I've got video, which I can't show now because I couldn't find it, on how to do this, but you basically erase microfolds by doing wet PTK. PTK in keratoconus is very important. I noticed not many people spoke about this, but the, the principle of PTK, transepithelial PTK, is that you will remove the peaks, like I said, because of the epithelium being thinner over peaks. And if you have an epithelial map, you can determine how much will re be removed of the stroma as you ablate to the bottom of the epithelium. And so here's an example of this where you have, um, I don't know if this video is showing, but I'm, I'm doing a 49 micron PTK. Well, it's not really uh, transmitting well, but I'm leaving tissue behind, okay? Uh, I'm stopping at 49 microns. And I have a map of what I expect the epithelium to look like at the end of 49 microns. In fact, I can go to it probably manually here. Yeah, there. So I stop at 49 microns and I can see the pattern of exposure here and a little bit of exposure here is replicated on the cornea. This, this, this zone here of exposure and another zone of exposure here. This was a short flap with a double ablation on the, on, and, so, and there was an irregularity on a hyperopic case. So. By, by, knowing the trans by knowing the epithelial ablation rate and knowing that you're going to be removing whatever is sticking into the epithelium, you can actually regularize corneas quite beautifully. Here's the step that was there because of the short flap with the double ablation. And you see here the topography was quite irregular nasally. It was completely regularized by this trans epithelial PTK. This epithelial irregularity is now regularized, and even the even the, um, the 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 negative staining from this pattern here is is now gone. So that's where I would use PTK. And in keratoconus, PTK is an amazing tool because what it does is it removes the irregularity of the cone that is being hidden from the topography. So you're actually getting more bang for your buck if you do a transepithelial topography guided treatment than if you just do a topography guided treatment. That's one of the reasons why the topography guided treatments in keratoconus undercorrect so much. It's because they undercorrect by the amount that the epithelium compensated. Um, and I, I think what was nice about Mohammed's talk was that he was explaining why you can sometimes flip the coma in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a surface corneal wavefront treatment. Because as he, as he showed, the whole eye, uh, well, actually, both, uh, um, both of you showed that, actually, that the back surface of the cornea is a negative of the front surface in terms of refractive index changes. And so if you're only going to correct, if you're going to fully correct the aberrations of the front surface, you're now exposing the aberrations of the back surface. And so essentially, you're going to have to leave coma on the front surface to compensate for the back surface coma 
which has a reverse sign. And that's all I would say about transepithelial and topography guiding. Thank you, Dan, because you, uh, you, you showed to me the results that I am showing in my talks about the beauty of the BTK removal of the epithelium by BTK before doing the corneal cross-linking. And it's much better than the epithelium removal by, by any manual method. Because, yes, I showed many times the, the, the power Obviously, of the corneal. It's, yeah, it's you're, you're using one of the principles of epithelial healing. You're yeah. using the fact that the epithelium will always be thinner over the peaks. I have beautiful example to show how okay. much the, the, the irregularity has converted to more regularity just by doing that, by removing the, P, the epithelium by PTK before the epi of corneal cross leading. Thank you. Thank you for the demonstration. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the rules. It's wonderful. What, 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 what I think is, a, is, if you don't mind me saying so in front of 400 people here, you know, I was measuring epithelium since 1991, okay? I was completely ignored for about five years. Nikki, welcome. I had oh, about Nikki. five How are you? <laughs> paying attention uh, for about 10 years. I had about 100 people paying attention until finally we got commercially available devices. And now everybody talks about the epithelium as if it's like obvious and everyone knows oh, it's obvious about the epithelium. Of course, we've always known that. But believe me, it was painful for the first 10 years to be completely ignored for years. You're talking about epithelial changes. And, and the only thing I would say that, I, the, that there's always a silver lining because the silver lining to have been ignored for 15, 20 years was that I managed to publish 40 papers on the epithelium. So now everybody has to reference me when they write a paper. And the, but, but here's the dark part of that silver lining of the cloud. The dark part of that is that every goddamn epithelial paper that anybody submits to a journal ends up with me as a request to review it. So <laughs> can you all like, do a bit more reviewing? Because it's getting, uh, I have a full-time job. I'm not going to, mind you, I don't have a full-time job now. None of us do. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody does. But thank you very much, Jen. I will keep it very short. I, I, um, I think I'm the last one. Did I forget anybody? No, you're the last one for hat. Last one. Okay, so I, I will pick out one question that I, that I had here. Um, I had several questions regarding the same thing. And they asked me, um, I mentioned in the slit lamp crosslinking talk that uh, you have to scan, you have to scan the riboflavin before you can crosslink. Let me just briefly explain what I mean. It is that the, the riboflavin comes in a kit with a speculum and a cap. The cap protects uh, the patient's eye from the device or vice versa, from cross-contamination. So there is a label on this uh, kit that has to be scanned. Now, when I hear as a surgeon that something has to be scanned, I always think, oh my God, this is going to be expensive. But this is not the reason why this is being done. The reason is so that every kit is being reused uh, every, for every procedure, a new kit has to be used. So a new cap that protects the eye. The kit is not the problem. The scanning is not the problem. The pricing is, is the sensitive thing. So what we urged Imagine to do via the distributors is to keep the price of this complete kit so low that it is compatible to the pure riboflavin from the, from the others in the field. So you shouldn't pay more for this type of riboflavin that, that comes along with the speculum and, and the cap, but you have to scan it to make sure that you always use um, a fresh one. That's, that's just what I wanted to add. Now I will hand over back to uh, uh, Jose. Uh, we cannot hear you, Jose. Cannot hear you. Thank no, you so no. much, everybody, for such an amazing meeting. Uh, we still have like uh, 600 people, 340 here, maybe uh, 200 on YouTube, which is after uh, four and hours and 20 minutes. We still have a lot of people here. Maybe because they know that there is a nice surprise after we end with the lectures. <laughs> we were waiting for it. Well, what is the surprise, Jose? <laughs> <laughs> Dense. Okay, we're That's ready. Dense surprise. <laughs> no, no, Renato, Renato, you, you was that Nikki on the on the on the on the screen. This this was a surprise. Nikki on the screen. So, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, hello, Nikki. 
Hello, hello. We should do that live one day. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't hear the piano while I was playing. But <laughs> the same here. I haven't stopped playing to listen to you, but so what are, it, was it totally out of sync out there? No, nah, no, nah, it was good. It was really nice. Yeah. Well, maybe you're all ophthalmologists. You wouldn't hear it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that was the first time ever that uh, two people have played over the internet together music at the end of a webinar, com medical webinar conference. So about what, keratoconus. Uh, yeah. So so and 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 blowing very hard into a saxophone could make the keratoconus worse. <laughs> we'll send you to Renato. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you know that right? You know that that uh, glaucoma can be affected by trumpet players. Absolutely. Yeah, guys, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. I learned so much. It was really really great. Susan, amazing. Mohammed, yeah, all of you, fantastic. Always great to see you. The same here. Thank you, Jose. Beautiful, Jose. beautiful, beautiful work. And thank yeah. you to all of the. What is it? Uh, three. How many people are left? But um, three hundred people left. Uh, extraordinary. I uh, hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs> okay. Well, guys, this has been later. Right? Yes, this it's on YouTube. I think YouTube is going to be left in the channel. Right. It's great to see you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you, Jose. Thanks, bye. guys. Bye, bye. bye Nikki. Bye, Hafezi. Bye, Susan. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Safe, safe. You too. Be safe. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right.